All right, welcome to uh, the second open session for uh, Alenka Zupanchik's uh, What is Sex? Uh, pre a preview here for the course, which I'll be co-teaching and co-hosting with David McCarricker of Theory Underground. Um, and this sort of approach, you know, we, we've already taught the, the introduction, uh, which you can find on both my channel and on, on Dave's, uh, on Theory Underground's channel. And um, now we're teaching the conclusion. So we're basically teaching the opening, you know, sort of the opening premises of the text and also the concluding premises of the text. I mean, and in principle, you could just watch this sort of sandwich, so to speak, of the opening and the conclusion and sort of get really the, the core message, let's say, um, of right. what Alenka is trying to communicate to us. And I think that that has an intrinsic value. I think if you're just interested in um, getting basically Alenka's opening premise and concluding premise, like I said, that, that, that has intrinsic value in and of itself. And I think we'll be able to cover um, a lot of Alenka's core, core sort of ideas in just this opening and conclusion. But it's also sort of a teaser and an opening to uh, a deep dive into the text itself. Um, and, you know, a deep dive into the text itself, I think, is, is really where, you know, I think um, this mini course is going to have a, a great um, and long term uh, impact on the culture potentially is really unpacking uh, some of the, the core theses that Alenka is trying to propose. And I would say, really, if I was to, you know, and I've wrestled with this text for several years now, um, really, I think what's at stake in this conversation and this, and this book is on the one hand, um, a, a foundational structure for thinking about sexuality philosophically, um, which is traditionally not done. Uh, it's a tremendously under-theorized topic in philosophy. So that's its first primary value, I would say. The second primary value is the way in which Alenka's thought in general, and I would say this extends to the Slovenian school in general, is the way in which Alenka's thought is uh, explicitly political. That for Alenka, the sexual and the political are connected and that there is a lot at stake philosophically in thinking the relationship between the sexual and the political. And I think that this is, this is a unique time to be, be teaching it as well. And, and, and also perhaps Alenka wrote this at this time for this purpose is that there is a tremendous political confusion in perhaps the West and perhaps the whole world, you know, plan thinking planetary society, it depends where we're thinking on local politics, national politics, global politics, you know, whatever scale you're thinking politics. I think that we do our culture and our psychology a great disservice if we think about the political without its relationship to the, to the sexual that the, the, the two are fundamentally linked there. So that's sort of a little um, opening in terms of the value there. Dave, did you wanna, did you wanna jump in and do, did, did we wanna do the, do you wanna save the announcement for the end or do we wanna jump into the announcement now? Or did you have anything you wanted mm, to add mm. here before I go into the slides? Yeah, I, I get, well, first of all, everybody, hello. This might be your first time seeing Cadell and I doing one of these. Um, so I, I'm David McCarricker and I'm the, with Theory Underground. The, I guess all I would want to add to that is that you say you've been struggling with this text for years. I've not been, and this is a lot newer to me. And it's, it's, it's seductively difficult and, or I, maybe that's the wrong, it's subject, okay. it, it's, it's, it's almost maybe that's not the, seductively um, lucid, actually, meaning that like you read it and you go, OK, I see what she's saying, but it's not going to click for you because you've really got to mull it over. You've really got to think about it. And so the thing that I wanted to say is like, I like this idea of the sandwich of making these two things public. Um, yeah. Uh, hold on. Is it actually I don't think it is it pinned on you right now? 
Is no, it, it's on you. It's it is on me. Okay, good. Okay, it it looked like it was still on you. Okay, so I like the idea of the sandwich. I like the idea of making the the introduction and the conclusion publicly available because basically the four chapters are going to be four in depth um, sessions where we yeah. we take each one and we go a lot a lot deeper. So um, that you know that begins on May seventh and goes through June in four sessions. Now, um, basically, I think that a lot of people will probably watch the beginning and the end, the parts that are public and free, and that's enough for them to be able to bookmark these to come back to when they're ready, but it will get the gears turning. And so I definitely think that this is one of those things where sometimes people are like, well, I don't, why would I want to do the conclusion before I've actually read the rest of the body of the text? And it's like, no, this is Sometimes before making a commitment to dive into something, you actually should be thinking about it already for a while. And with the current discourse where it's at, gender ideology left, gender ideology right, because they're both ideology. Um, I think that having this in your toolkit just for thinking as you go forward for the next few years, it'll be productive. And so um, I think that was the main thing that I wanted to say before we get to the slides. All right. Well, I think as sort of um, carrying on from our praxis in the opening, just um, I'll sort of go through the slides and then you raise your hand if you want to jump in and then we'll we'll do it like that. All right. All right. So, yeah, yeah so that that's that's and I just want to sort of reemphasize Dave's point there that I think that's sort of holding together our analysis when we're or at least our aim and focus as teachers in this course is we really want to go beyond the ideologies of perhaps the unconscious ideologies of sexuality and as it regards to the way leftist and rightist tend to interpret gender. Um, and I think that, that that has a lot to do with what we are calling the culture wars. So, you know, with that being said, let's, let's, let's dive in. All right. So this is a little bit of a technical image there on the right hand side. Uh, you can have time to sort of soak that up or soak that in. I'm not, you know, we're not going to rush this, you know, there's not that many slides we're going to need to get through. So uh, there's no basically saying there, there's no rush here. We're, we're just going to go in a, in, a, in a more relaxed uh, approach to this lecture. So if I would say, what is the core idea and what is sex? Well, the core idea is what Alenka calls an ontoepistemological shortcut. Now, this requires a little bit of um, a logical explanation that traditionally in philosophy, when we think about epistemology or when we think about ontology, we're thinking about them as separated. We're thinking about knowledge, our epistemological praxis on the one one side, and ontology or being uh, on the other on the other side. Now, not only is Alenka following in the tradition of what I would call the Hegelian move, which is a sort of onto epistemology. But she's, I think, even going one step further, which perhaps takes us into psychoanalysis, which is the ontoepistemological short, short circuit. That is, what is sex for Lenka? It is precisely this short circuit between epistemology and ontology, where if you see that image on the right-hand side, what we're dealing with is simultaneously the impossibility of sexual being, that would be the ontology, and the failure of our representations. So what we're thinking simultaneously is one, the impossibility of the being we would like to actualize in sexuality unconsciously, and the failure of our representations, the failure of our gender identity on the other side. So really this to me is a powerful bomb. And this, I've carried this with me now for several years, which is if you want to think about it in its simplest way, on the one hand, the way we represent our gender fails. On the other hand, the desire we have for a certain sexual being. And that might be difficult to think. It might be, well, I think if you're really, now when I say that's very simple what I'm communicating, but at the same time I'm saying, I've carried that with me for years in my, in, in my thinking is that it's very simple, but it's also, if you really think it through for years, it's also going to help you through a lot of emotional difficulties. 
on the one hand, of course, I could just say in a crude type of way as it relates to ontology, like, I mean, let me go to right to the core here in a most personal way, because I do think that this requires some personal engagement. On the one hand, if I think about the way I felt about the first woman I had a crush on, <laughs> there's a way in which when I had that crush and well, when I've been sexually attracted to a member of the opposite sex throughout my young life, there's a way in which I wanted to unify with that person. There's a way in which I wanted to make that being a reality. Of course, what you encounter is the impossibility of such a desire. Now, just because that desire is impossible, that doesn't mean it goes away. It persists. You have to keep working with it. You have to keep, it's almost like an unavoidable impossibility that you can't just deconstruct or get rid of. It's almost the core of our motivational system, the core of our drive, you could say. Now, on the other hand, the epistemology, our gender construction, for Alenka, the gender construction or the epistemology we construct of our self-identity is a type of relationship to that desire, a relationship to that actualization of that, that impossible being. So, for example, if I think back to when I was, quote unquote, becoming a man, going through puberty and so forth, a lot of the way in which I constructed my gender identity was some sort of attempt, uh, you might say an attempt to predict, an attempt to anticipate the possibilities of actualizing that being, right? Basically, how could I structure my identity as a man in order to actualize that impossible being, right? So. Ultimately, what's at stake with this move is the more self-reflexive we become about how we construct our gender identity in relationship to this ontological impossibility, the more we'll be able to navigate that desire and make that crucial transition, which is so essential in the Slovenian school tradition, which is that transition from desire to drive. And what's the basic distinction between desire and drive? at least within this tradition of thinking, it's on the one hand, the desire to fill the impossible sexual being. On the other hand, the enjoyment of the impossibility of that being, right? So actually what is great about our strange existential condition as it relates to sexuality is that we cannot get what we want. That actually getting everything we want is actually a trap. And we can talk about how this is a trap. I mean, I'm thinking of several things in my head right now. I mean, the first thing is sort of seeing that people who usually have a head start in life or people who, um, let's say, have uh, socioeconomic advantages in life, uh, they actually mature later. There's a risk of maturing later because they don't encounter that deadlock. Or mm. people who, for example, are, let's say, sexually uh, gifted <laughs> or have some sort of, whether it's they're more attractive than other people or they're more sexually, I don't know, somehow socially more gifted than other people in the sexual arena for whatever reason, they encounter this impossibility. They encounter this failure later in some sense. So, but the overall point is that there's this confrontation with the impossibility of our desire and there's a perspectival shift on this being a negative thing mm. it's actually a positive thing and it opens up the possibilities for a reflexive mature process of sublimation now that process of sublimation can take many different directions for me i have uh, let's say worked with sublimation as it relates to athletics, as it relates to philosophy, as it relates to academics, it could be many, 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 many different things. But basically what you're doing is, is you're taking that core motivational system, that core impulse, and you're channeling it towards ultimately 
non-sexual ends, or another way of saying it could be that you channel it towards uh, an indirect as opposed to a direct mediation. A direct mediation is that you want that object, you want that thing. An indirect mediation is that you rather circle the thing and you enjoy the gap. And I think that that actually as a foundation is super important for long-term relationships. If we're thinking about long-term relationships, we want to think about maintaining that gap. You don't want to just be one thing and you don't want to just suffocate your partner. And you also don't want to have so much distance that you don't relate at all, right? That would be a breakup. What you want to do is you want to maintain that gap with your partner. And what that requires is, is that you and your partner are constantly revealing mysterious parts of yourself in an ongoing dialectic with the other, the one and the other. It's impossible to be one, but it's also, you know, not just a, an indifferent multiplicity, right? So we're, we're navigating. And to me, if I'm bringing that to my, again, to my practical self-mediation, that is infinitely valuable for a relationship, infinitely valuable, because what you're focusing on is a long-term self-mediation with you and the other, and you can never be one. But you're also one in that tension, let's say. That's, it's the tension which is the one, let's say. So, yeah, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, this, this is really good. Um, the, the, the way that this actually factors into a long-term relationship is, you know, a, a crucial question, I think, for a lot of people for whom that is a goal, right? Yeah. Um, it's a goal. It's a goal for me. I'm getting married this July. And so, uh, you know, the, the goal is a long-term relationship, right? And it's like, well, I don't think I ever really, I, I was always kind of in this, in this tension between being like, oh, I don't really believe in marriage. It's a social construction. It's just this whatever. And then on the other side being like, but I want to have a long-term committed relationship, you know, and obviously these two things, those two things uh, need not be mutually exclusive. Um, and there, and I've gone through stages of belief and disbelief and for various reasons, of course, those reasons might not be the real reasons, right? Those might be the fantasies or the, the fairy tales that she talks about in this piece um, when she's talking about the, the fundamental lack um, at the core of sexual being being something that drives us, not just parents, but children to come up with sort of fairy tales for making sense of these failures. And uh, she says that this is not just, we, we don't just come up with these fairy tales to cover over um, like uh, a real truth that could just be made explicit. No, like there's actually, there, 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 there are things there that can't be made explicit because they are in fact just a negativity, right? And so the one thing I wanted to touch on, though, uh, just in uh, I always I always do this as a preface to talking about desire and drive now, because um, we're talking about it as enjoyment of impossibility of perfect being, um, right. the enjoyment of the impossibility of perfect being, as opposed to desire, which is it has like this fantasy, this formative fundamental fantasy of this perfect being, right? And in this case, we're talking about a love relationship. Oh, this perfect union, this holistic union. Everything is give and take, right? This is the sexual relation that Lacan says is not real. Um, so, but enjoyment, we talk about enjoyment as jouissance because that is the French word here. Um, and I just always like to drive home that enjoyment should be thought of as basically the opposite of pleasure. There's the dialectic here, but the the point is to not conflate enjoyment with like oh rapturous being, happiness, ecstasy. But as opposed in, in, as opposed to that, enjoyment should be thought of as something that could be subjectively experienced as misery. Right? You, sure. it's it's because this enjoyment of impossibility of perfect being is terrible. I mean, really it's, it's the reason that teenagers go through such a hard time, right? Like it's, it's, yeah. it's coming into a realization of the impossibility of this and that, that, uh, and it's like, not just, it, it's almost like, instead of saying the enjoyment of the impossibility of perfect being, we could say the unconscious enjoyment of conscious misery and drama, 
right? Like with, right. Uh, it, it's exhilarating. It makes life interesting. It's definitely not boring, but it can be depressing. It can be anxiety inducing. It can be a lot of words that we would typically uh, perceive as, as not, as not preferable, but at the same time, we're not just pleasure seeking animals. We're, it's not just desire. Desire is in this dialectic with drive. And so drive well, just needs to sense, undermine desire. In some sense, the self is constituted by desire. So in some sense, in the mode of drive, in regards to what you're saying, I think in regards to drive is like, it's kind of like the self, I don't want to say totally overcome, but in some sense, the self is, is, has been marginalized, <laughs> right? The self takes a back seat or at mm. least becomes less um, dominant uh, in terms of its ego ideal, let's say. Something exactly. like that. But like, you know, it's like, I mean, this, like we could also engage, for example, in the Buddhist tradition where desire is, is, is equal to suffering. Um, and uh, that that's really the struggle of the self, overcoming the self is in some sense, to overcome the way in which we create our own suffering through desiring objects, impossible objects, that nothing ever fills the lack, nothing ever fills the hole, so to speak. And, and drive, I think, is a very unique concept that psychoanalysis introduces and develops, which I don't know if it has an analogous concept in the Buddhist tradition, but it certainly puts the emphasis on movement. It puts the emphasis on things keep moving. And 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 the uncon and really the movement is the unconscious uh, that keeps moving. But just want to hear maybe complete sort of the reflections on these slides, which is basically again sort of emphasizing that with Alenka's work, it's always connected to the political. That and this is continued on in her work um, in her latest book um, on Antigone. Um, uh, let them rot, which I would also, I mean, and, and, you know, as is sort of core for Alenka's work is that she seems to pack a big punch in small works, right? Like her latest book, Let Them Rot is like 80 pages, 90 pages. And what is sex is like 160 pages or something. It's not that big, but at the same time, it, it does pack a, pack a big punch. And, and I like that about Alenka's work is that she, she must spend a lot of time um, condensing her thought and, and saying basically like, what is it that I really just want to say? I don't need a thousand pages to say it. I just need a hundred pages to say it. But um, again, the most daring implication is this link between the ontology and epistemology. We cannot think about ontology disconnected from epistemology and we cannot think epistemology disconnected from ontology. And I think that that is a, a problem within both leftist and rightist ideologies today is that they don't think the relation between the two, let alone the short circuit between the two. Because again, this impossibility and this failure of our identities is something which is an ongoing dialectic, which is sort of to think about the way in which our identities are precisely short-circuited, the way in which our self-representations of what we think is true and what we think is real oftentimes go through tremendous transformations uh, in the vicissitudes of sex and love. Um, and and that's, that's something to keep in mind. And then finally, just my last point on this slide, and maybe Dave, you want to jump in a little bit, is that um, ultimately here we're thinking about something which is constitutively fallen out of a signifying structure. And this is what's at stake in becoming more reflexive about unconscious knowing is that when we're not reflexive about unconscious knowing, we always want to find a signifier which will complete the chain. So for example, I, and this happens politically, like if you think about the way in which people relate to their ideological connection to whether it's a conservative, a liberal, or communist, or religious ideology. You know, I'm trying to cover the whole field there. I'm not trying to align with one ideology over another. I'm just trying to identify that there's a common ideological mechanism that's working on the level of something that's missing, something that's fallen out of the signifying structure. Of course, like we could give like, um, like almost a funny comedic example with 
make America great again, if we're thinking about that slogan, make America great again. But even if you, if you go to like, for example, Barack Obama's slogan of, I think it was like, yes, we can, or what was the- the Change, hope. Change and hope is that what's going on in political slogans like that is they're basically proposing to the masses, they're proposing to the population that they have found the signifier and they embody the signifier which could complete what has fallen out of the chain. And and so that's why it's so interesting to think about the relationship between unconscious sexuality and politics, because we want to somehow avoid this repetition, which our species seems to fall into constantly and naturally, of this person who's going to save us from the gap, the person who's going to save us from the lack. Uh, And I think that this also can be done, obviously, in intimate partner relationships, where your intimate partner is perceived as the missing being, which is going to save you from the fall, which is going to save you from this unconscious structure. And ultimately, you know, like from a Lacanian point of view is that just because we have an unconscious, that doesn't mean we're not responsible for that unconscious. Just because, just because this is sort of the way in which we find our, 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 you know, existential condition, let's say, doesn't mean we're not responsible for it. And so I think a lot of the times when I look at the discourses, whether it's the masculinist or the feminist discourses about sexuality, what I see is a lot of irresponsible relation to this structure. You can exploit this structure, you can manipulate this structure, you can masquerade with this structure, Right. And and I think that a lot of a lot of maturation and responsibility here is at stake in in really thinking this deeply. Shall I move Perfect. on, Dave? Do you want to go? Do you wanna... I do. I want to to do a couple of things here. Um, yeah. The fir- so the first one is to say, well, I do want to kind of just go over the graph a little bit just to sure. kind of clarify my own understanding of it, because that might be helpful for some people. And then um, I did. I realized that you had asked me point blank if we should announce the special announcement. And then I, I said all the things that I wanted to say and I didn't come back to the announcement. Let's announce but it I at the of, end. I like the idea of just kind of, you know, teasing people here. So yeah, okay. the that'll be the drive of this whole conversation. Right. Um, <laughs> as opposed to the desire just to know what is, what is, what is it? But the thing I wanted, so just on the, you know, talking about various ide- ideologies, um, I think for me, it was a very big moment to kind of realize, yeah, we, we, you know, we can critique ideology at the level of the explicit meaning, the implicit meaning, and then also the Zizekian approach, which is to think about the, the way drive is functioning in any ideology. But um, then there was another big moment, which was to realize, oh, with, with any ideology, if it's working, then there's actually something to it beyond probably what is self understood by the participants or believers. Um, and so like, what's the kernel that's working for it. And then the, I think that the, the big idea here is that there can also, it can, it can be, instead of there must be something to it. It could also be that that something is a nothing, yeah. right? That there's a constitutive lack that is actually being productive for all of these ideologies See, seeming to be able to grab a hold of and work for people to make sense for people because there's a fundamental issue that they are helping to uh, to cover over for. So I, I found that interesting. But as far as the graph goes, okay, um, we, we already touched on desire and drive, but the top says disembodied reason equals obfuscates impossible lack with positive content. And then non-rational truth equals impossibility, positively conditions, rational possibilities. And so is that first one, um, is that ontology? And then the the other one is epistemology. Is that what's, is that kind of well, what you're thinking? This, disembodied reason would be a, would be a certain tendency of, a, of, of epistemology. Okay, okay. That would be a certain disembodied knowledge system. And and that's and that's and that's pretty commonplace in contemporary academia, I would say, which is that it's a knowledge system with no relationship to their actual embodied life. 
The reason I thought that might have been having to do with ontology is because it says it obfuscates the impossible lack with positive content and the yeah well that that it's ontology it's, tends to deal with the ontology tends to deal with the positive well, content right so no that that's correct that's correct it's it's but so like the the disembodied reason is an epistemology which imagines itself disconnected from an ontology but it really isn't okay and then just just because not everybody's non-rational like, truth would be the ontology okay Perfect. And then basically ontologies has to do with, with trying to being. deduce structures of being, trying to understand being in a more general way, as opposed to just totally. dealing with on, ontic manifestations. And then epistemologies is how we know, but the, yeah. the, the short circuit, so on the graph, for people who aren't looking at it, it basically shows ontology, epistemology, there's a line with an arrow pointing both ways. The short circuit is happening between the two, you know, uh, yeah. Along that line, beneath that, it says impossible sexual being, i.e. absence slash lack. And then in, in another parenthetical, it says failed repeating unconscious knowing. Both of those are pointing at S1, which has a cool graphic around it. And then be beneath that, it says self-consciousness. Now, what I'd like to kind of have unpacked here. So, because when I think of S1, I think of a master signifier. Exactly. But is it Okay, and so it, it looks like you have like a sort of black hole there, and so there's it's a like circle. The, it's like when I say, like for example, "Make America Great Again," it's kind of like the master signifier which covers the hole. Okay, right? Like, so, like so, like now it could be, for example, like let's say, for example, you know, like in the contemporary sexual discourse of like a, let's say, like a Chad or a Tyrone, like an alpha male type guy. Yeah, this would be an S one. Right, like the Chad, like the Chad has the unique symbolic position in relationship to the lacking sexual being. Like he is the uh, the desirable. Uh, he is the one. Or, for example, you know, uh, it could on the feminine side, it could be she is the actual being itself. She, you know, she, 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 she is the masquerade of her form is the being. Okay, you know, I, so I guess the the the. the the cliche would be the um, uh, what is it? The Stacy, forget the name, but like there's a, a a name for the archetypal beautiful woman, you know, the Chad and the Stacy or something. Like that. I forget what it is. Yeah, every, everyone always talks about the Chad, but we 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 forget. And then you got the Chad wife, right? And so right. part of what these I want are to different. Do is... These are different epistemological responses, right? Like they're they're different attempts to navigate the impossible sexual being. So basically it's like, I'll be a trad wife, right? It's a certain performative response to this lack. Right. And so and these are almost archetypical performative responses to these to this lack. And yeah. the different ideologies have their different ways of trying to, you know, play off of it. Now, the 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 question I have then is is about so you desire this impossible sexual being with a positive object and then drive enjoys the impossibility of that let's use two two archetypical examples then the sex the sex positive feminist girl boss and the sure. and the and the and the catholic trad wife with 10 kids on the way and <laughs> uh, and bare barefoot in the kitchen. I'm just, I'm going with the stereotype at this point more than the yeah. actual archetype. So, so what is the desire versus the drive in these two situations here? Right. Well, okay. So now in regard, in regards to the, the archetypal, archetypal performance, in regards to the archetypal performativity, I mean, there is no, um, there is no way, let's say to obviously um escape the the tension as such but there are ways in which people can come up with self-conscious identities like for example the girl boss or like for example the trad wife where they so strongly identify with that identity on the level of their self-consciousness that they think that that is the answer or they think that is the way, 
right? right. Like, and, and, and they think that in such a way as that they think there's basically no unconscious here. So the, the mm. risk there, whatever, so the general rule would be whatever identity you construct, whether it's the girl boss, whether it's the trad wife, you don't want to think that that identity is so complete and so coherent that there's not going to be the possibility of a disruption to that identity, right? Because okay. if you think your identity is complete and closed with no possibility of disruption, you're almost guaranteed to be disrupted. The, the approach here, irrespective of whether you're the girl boss or the trad wife, is you want to build the possibility, the condition of possibility for disruption into that identity itself. Because if mm -hmm. you build the condition of possibility of disruption into that identity itself, you're making room for the unconscious. Now, the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the consequence of that, the consequence of that is that you have to make room for a higher order relationship to anxiety and the truth of anxiety. Because if you know that my identity as a trad wife or my identity as a girl boss, whatever it is, is possibly susceptible to a short circuit, then you're dealing with the possibility that you are going to have to relate to your identity as an ongoing processual negotiation, which will unfold over decades. And that might involve major identity transformations, right? Like something okay. like there are contingent, there are contingent events that you could encounter, which would disrupt the presuppositions of your identity as the best possible response to your sexual situation. So for instance, um, the sex positive is, I mean, it's almost in the name, the, the desire there is for yeah. a full sexual life. You've, you've, you've expressed yourself in every possible way. You, you you're able to get what you want and you're able to do so obviously in a way that's, 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 uh, that's equal and, and, and that, it's, but it's an individualistic kind of vision, you know, of, of self-actualization as opposed to its opposite almost, which is the trad wife. It's that idea of being the help meet you are, you know, or the help, the, the mate you're, you're, you are, you know, it, it's, it, it's, you're like Eve, right. You're so, there to help the man. Right. And so, yeah, so, so the, in, in that sense, you're completing your, your, your fullness isn't completing a man in that case. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. And Alenka will say that the conservative structure depends on the woman being, the woman performing in such a way as that she um, fills the hole for the man. Okay. Like that the right. conservative, like for Alenka's point of view, the conservative side depends on that structure and it depends on obfuscating the antagonism of sexual difference as such, that, that man and woman have their place, so to speak. Right. She right. says that she says that explicitly. So like on the side of the girl boss, that the, there's if you if you too strongly identify with these caricatures, there's the possibility for almost like a comical inversion. Which is like if you're the girl boss who thinks I'm an individual who can make a career and have the sex I want and be totally fulfilled as a neoliberal individual you run the risk of encountering such a short circuit or a disruption that you totally flip and become a trad wife because you, uh, because you, you've, you've, you've neglected such like, there's so many stories of, for example, women who either like did only fans or did some sort of sexually very promiscuous activity. And then all of a sudden they flip, right? Like, oh, I'm not that anymore. I'm just going to do the trad wife thing now. So oftentimes these extremes our responses to the other extreme. Right, right. So like, for example, on the trad wife side, if you think, oh, I'm just gonna fulfill my role as a good housewife and have children and be a good wife for my partner and stuff like that, then you could encounter a situation where you realize, oh, my identity is too much tied into the mother role and now I don't know anything about myself and I don't really know what I want to do and I don't really know what I want to create and I don't really know what how I want to perform outside of being a mother, outside of being a wife, right? So you feel then claustrophobic almost with your identity, right? So I'm saying with these extremes, there's no one, like the reality of the sexual process is always going to be much more complex 
than any archetype we could pick out of like, like we're picking our clothes for the day. Like, oh, I'm gonna perform this way. I'm gonna perform that way. You also see that in the progressivist ideology where people are like, I'm gonna perform as this gender today. I'm gonna perform mm -hmm. as this gender now. It's always a simplification of the actual sexual process, which is going to engage necessarily with the disruption of that simplification. That's that's perfect. So that pretty much touches on the things I wanted to do on this part before we advance. So that's really. I think good. it's important that we had an extended medi mediation of this because I think it it's the only slide I'm presenting here where, you know, just getting into sort of like the technical um, representation. But what you're seeing there with the gap. What you're seeing there with the gap of self-consciousness is when you have the closure of that gap, like self-consciousness basically obfuscates the fact that it has an unconscious, that's where you run into the, 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 the disruption and you basically have the, the closed loop idealization. So you just wanna make room for that gap. So like, for example, with me, it's like, you know, I, I mean, it's not like I'm not committed or it's not like I don't have a, let's say a stable understanding of my gender, but that's something that I've developed over time as a process. And it's not something that I can put an easy like identity label onto, mm -hmm. right? It's something that's almost been a negotiation with me, with my partner, um, through disruption. It's like, again, I think the crucial thing is you want to build disruption into your identity uh, as opposed to pretending like you are like a Superman or a Superwoman. Mm -hmm. Right? Perfect. You're not, you know, and these, these representations of Chad and Stacy, these are just ridiculous, obviously, caricatures of basically the perception that there is some alpha man or there's this perception that there's some, you know, super attractive woman who just has the sexual being and it's solved for them, which is, of course, nobody is in that situation. Right. And, and we're going to go into deep in that in like the deep dives and stuff. All right. So let's go into the knowledge drive. All right. So again, this sync, like there is a way in which what Alenka is doing is presenting us with a singularity. Right, so it's not the binary, it's not the non-binary. It's almost like every gender identity is a response to this singularity of, of, of the unconscious. And, and precisely, she says that this view of the world, this way of seeing things is opened up by psychoanalysis. That before psychoanalysis, uh, there was, um, let's say, an obfuscation of this singularity with, for example, traditional notions of God or traditional notions of a hierarchical being, right? Like the king at the top of society or the pharaoh at the top of society. They were the singular being, the highest principle of being. Uh, and really what the situation is, is that we all share this sort of singular relationship to the unconscious. Um, which is actually mediating a lot of those desires which were represented in religion, which were represented in traditional society, whether it was the king uh, and the royal family um, and, and all of those you know, dynamics were basically, um, let's say, almost childish um, reifications of unconscious desire. Like if you think about, for example, the archetype of the king or the pharaoh who had like a concubines of women and stuff like that, of course that's represented in the unconscious. <laughs> and it's just like the king had this ridiculous uh, capacity to actualize that. It, it's kind of comedic, you know, how ridiculous it is, but it, it's kind of like what humans do if they are in a artificial environment which prevents them from facing the, the, the negativity of the unconscious. It's like, you can just have whatever you want. Like in Game of Thrones, I know you're a Game of Thrones fan, um, Dave, is like, if you think about the character of Joffrey, like the right. character of Joffrey is a perfect example of the obfuscation of the unconscious. He, and, mm -hmm. and what does he do? He becomes incredibly violent with sexuality. In mm -hmm. almost, almost so disturbingly violent <laughs> because actually, you know, did you want to respond to that? I think. 
Well, there's scenes. There are definitely there's a couple of scenes where, where he's you know because he's just he's just gone through puberty. Really, they don't say that, but it's true. Like if you think about his age, and how does that manifest? Like you know the uh, so, so for anyone who doesn't know, so he's the prince. He's currently like basically ruling a kingdom, and then uh, they're like, well, maybe if we get him laid, he'd chill out. And so they send him a couple of prostitutes to, and they try to put the moves on him. And instead he tortures them, right? He He's not interested. I in, was thinking about that scene. That's, it's honestly the worst. It's one of the, the it's one of those scarring things. Like it, it you were yeah. talking about how, when we watch those kind of scenes where like you want, you want to leave the room and you can't, you can't handle it. It's like, that's, that's one of those ones for sure. And so uh, <laughs> tying that back into, you're basically saying, yeah, this is so, so instead of, having to deal with the impossibility and, 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 and negativities of our unconscious desire, someone in a position like that thinks, oh, I really am the king. I really can have whatever I exactly. want. Exactly. And, and Zizek, I think, always makes fun of that. Like, and the it's, only it's good- The, the, the king only, who thinks he's a king. Yeah, and if you, the entirety of Game of Thrones, even the bad seasons, could be read through this lens of- uh, it's a, the entire show is about uh, the only good ruler is the one who knows I'm I'm just I'm I'm giving this an honest shot. I care about the realm as opposed to the ruler who says, "Oh, this is real. I really am a ruler." Every time someone says, "Oh, I really am the ruler," then they 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 degenerate over time. Like Stannis goes from being like, "Yeah, okay, he he's a plausible king," to uh, destroying everything every opportunity he ever had you know absolutely and i think that's i think we could generalize this uh it to again the importance of the relation between sexuality and politics is that when we build um uh or attempt to strive for let's say emancipatory communities or emancipatory social networks uh we want to make sure that the leaders in those networks or ideally the leaders in those networks know that they are not like the thing <laughs> like they know they're lacking too and and when it and when the leader comes from that space of lack it basically opens up the space for them to actually relate to the to the others not as superior they might have more experience they might have more knowledge because of time because of age because of work but that doesn't it's it's like Again, the king who thinks he's a king, even the professor who thinks he's a professor. And at the same time, we do need professors. We do need leaders. We do need people who take charge and, and, and initiate things. It's just that you don't want it to, so to speak, get to your head, that you also have an unconscious, like that you are also lacking, so to speak. So mm -hmm. I think that's, that's important. So just to, to continue on with this slide, and I, I don't know how much time we need to spend on this slide, but just the crucial point here, which I think is, is at work here, is re in relation to the drive of knowledge, which is classical in the Freudian tradition, is that there's no intrinsic drive for knowledge. For Freud, there's no intrinsic knowledge drive. And it's not that we, uh, for example, um, have... Well, basically, the drive of knowledge for Freud is the result of the lack or the incompleteness at the heart of sex. So when the soon, basically, the sooner we re realize, the sooner we recognize this lack or this incompleteness at the heart of sex, for Freud, the sooner this drive for knowledge kicks in as a response to this lack. So what's at stake in regards to more disembodied forms of knowledge, and by disembodied forms of knowledge, I mean knowledge which is not in a relationship to you personally. So like that's why I try, I try to bring it back to me personally as much as I can, is that the consequence of that is that you don't realize, and this is a typical masculine fantasy, is that you don't realize that what you're interested in knowledge-wise is actually a response to the sexual deadlock. I think that this actually appears most comically in physics. I think there are a lot of physicists who are trying to build a grand unified theory of physics, which are actually trying to uh, 
<laughs> unify the sexual, <laughs> the sexual relationship actually. Like that what they're doing in their knowledge is actually so disconnected from their body that they think they're trying to solve fundamental theories in physics, but what they're really doing is tearing with a sexual problem. And I think that this is almost comically on display in, in contemporary academia, and it actually might be the downfall of academia because academia is so disconnected from the body, it's so disconnected from the personal life of the people teaching there that it might be eroding itself. You know, and, and that actually might be making room for people like us, Dave, like, like the reason why we're doing what we're doing is because we are trying to connect what we're doing to our life in a way that I don't think you'll see in academia that often. And yeah, because we want what we're doing intellectually to add to what we're doing in the rest of our life yes. and to inform and to in, and the rest of our life to inform what we're doing intellectually. And I think that's also driving why we're both independent of one another already for years been building up to these kinds of in-person events, right? I've been doing in-person events for 10 years. The underground was built to be hybrid. Like the first, the first like seven months of operation is all building up to a, a U.S. tour where the main goal is to meet all the main fellow travelers who are actually involved. And the, the reason for this is, you know, when we're online, we forget that we have bodies when, but yeah. most communication is embodied, right? Most, most communication is embodied. And then when you're, when you're online, it's almost like the, this leveling of all avatars and, and aliases kind of having like this, this equality to them when in reality, it's like, yeah, but only some of them would actually speak up they would only only some of them would actually say something and 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 it, in person i mean right uh, and the how they say it is going to be different right because it's, it's really easy to be offensive or antagonistic online try to try try it in real life you know it's not it's not the same thing and obviously it, it i think people who are very online when they try to have a difficult conversation it can become hypercharged in a way that it wouldn't if they were more accustomed to grounding out in the world with people, right? And so I don't know, I, I, those are not suitable reasons for wanting to be hybrid. Those are a few of the reasons. I think there's a lot more reasons, but yeah, anyway, yeah, this is the, the importance of the body and, and the unconscious and stuff like, that comes with it is in these interpersonal interactions. Yeah. Um, I guess like the only the only thing I want to add there uh, in regards to like this reflection on the relationship between maybe what we're doing and and the university is like oftentimes due to the structure of the university, I mean, you'll have people studying things their whole career in an objective way, which has nothing to do with their subjectivity. Like, for example, I don't know, like I the example of like, I don't know, like studying macaques in, Ethiopia I, like it just the, and, and you spend your entire life studying something which is just very disconnected from anything related to your personal life and that takes its toll or if you're just repeating teaching the same course year in year out and it has no relationship to you yeah um, this takes its toll um on both the knowledge and the being and, and so we, we want to bring that knowledge and that being into a, not only into an onto epistemology, but an onto epistemology, which is constantly susceptible to short circuits, disruptions, and so forth. And that's really where we're going to get new knowledge and new being, right? And I think that's what we're trying to write out. Like, we're, we're trying to write out both new knowledge and new being through the short circuit, through the disruption. All right, so... Here, a quote from, from the book. One of Freud's major theories concerns sexuality as the realm within which the quest desire for knowledge takes off. This Freudian genealogy of the passion for knowledge is in itself complex and intriguing, but its basic outline would be as follows. There is no original drive for knowledge. It surfaces at points of existential difficulty. For example, when children feel threatened by the fact or the possibility of acquiring a sibling. Sexuality very soon becomes an obvious player in all questions about being there, of oneself and of others. It enters the stage with the question of being, how do we come to be? And it enters as negativity, as the unsatisfactory character of all possible positive answers. All right, so 
this is really an interesting thread which Alenka is going to be following and developing throughout the conclusion. It's a short conclusion, but I think this is where her focus is, is basically on the problematic nature of our origin. And when we think about our origin, obviously it involves sexuality. We are produced through sexual reproduction. The fact that we as beings are conditioned by sexual reproduction often never comes into the picture of classical epistemologies. Classical epistemologies leave out the fact that the way we are structured as beings is as beings that come into being through sexuality. And so this is something which psychoanalysis tries to problematize, question, in, in, you know, investigate. Um, and, and the central core idea is that there is no original knowledge drive. The knowledge drive is almost like an after effect of this, of this, of this sexual impulse. And, and that precisely not just the positivity of the sexual impulse, on the contrary, the existential difficulty that's involved in, 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 the, in the sexual impulse. Like she gives the example of a child being threatened by acquiring a sibling. This is actually something very disturbing to think about as someone who has younger brothers and sisters. Um, I actually, you know, I can actually talk about this because me and my brother have talked about this. I have a younger brother who's 16 months younger than me. And when we were kids, when we played video games together, I would always be Mario and he would always be Luigi. And he would always, and then he, later on in life, he told me that that had a psychological effect on him. It had a psychological effect. That, <laughs> no. Yeah, but this is, that, that cuts deep. And, I, and we had a talk about it. We talked about it. We, we hugged it out. We've, we've, we've reconciled about that. But that's how deep the unconscious goes. And that's, and what that means is that what that could mean is, is that when I was like 12 months old, when I was just a baby, it's not like I'm like, I have to take responsibility for myself. This is, this is an example of taking responsibility for the unconscious, right? Cause it's not like I'm guilty for, you know, being threatened by a sibling when I'm 12 months old. Like it's just, you know, it's, the way we are, it's sort of the way we're structured. But it does mean that I have to reconcile with something that's quite disturbing, which is what, how, how did I structure my identity as a boy in relationship to my brother in a way that was unconsciously threatened by him and trying to defend myself against him? Right, by, by something as silly as making him be Luigi and Mario. Right, so these these types of things are are what we find when we do when we pay attention to the unconscious. Let's see. Okay, so we go on. I don't know if there's anything else we need to pull out here, but just the the central idea here is that in psychoanalysis, there's a way in which traditional scientists or traditional theologians or traditional modes of knowledge in general are, in some sense, what you could call castrated. Because what they think they're interested in, in terms of their scientific knowledge, in terms of their theological knowledge, in terms of their philosophical knowledge, are actually being governed by a sexual impulse and trying to reconcile a sexual difficulty, an existential difficulty on the level of libido, right? I don't think that this is um, adequately respected in our um, intellectual circles. We'll say that. All right, so the gap and the lack before family. Here, Alenka tries to point towards the way in which sexuality provides no point of attachment, no anchoring point in being in the explication of being. Now think about this in regards to, for example, the very popular psychological psychoanalytic theories of attachment. How often do you hear people talk about attachment theory? And they talk about what's your attachment style? Are you anxious attachment? Are you avoidant attachment? Are you this type of attachment? Are you that type of attachment? What Alenka is saying is that sexuality provides no such mode of attachment. There is no, you know, all, the, all of the different responses of attachment are 
sort of ways of navigating the gap or the lack at the core of sexuality. There's no final, like, like, like I was going to make a slide with a, a Nicki Minaj uh, lyric where in a recent song, Nicki Minaj released, she said, I fell in love with a gangster. So I hold him down like an anchor. Right. Mm. So, but there's no anchor point in being Nicki Minaj as a rapper is trying to, you know, be, you know, showing bravado, showing confidence saying, I fell in love with a gangster. I'm going to hold him down like an anchor, basically meaning that I am going to be the anchoring point in being, I am the thing, the anchor point in being, which will hold down this alpha male. But mm. the, if you actually look into the real of Nicki Minaj, well, she's constantly uh, anchoring different men. She's not the anchor for one guy. She's, she just performs and masquerades as an anchor for men. And she goes through many breakups. Like that's the real of Nicki Minaj. Right. So <laughs> you want to, you want, you want to, you want to have the relationship between yes. You, 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 this is it. For example, the self-consciousness obfuscating the unconscious. And of course we find it attractive and it's obviously just a performance and a masquerade and a song, but it just, it gets across that point. I mean, we could bring it more close to home is that we want to think about attachment. We want to think about anchoring in being again, as a process and as a, as a process that can always be disrupted. And we just want to become more self-conscious about the way in which that uh, our, 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 our different attachment style. And, you know, it's just that the way in which people usually talk about attachment theory is as if there's no unconscious, right? right? Like they, they, they talk about it in, I would say, a very naive, positivist way again. So just want to become more aware about that. And, and, and we want to recognize sort of that there, there is no one solution here. You know, and that's 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 I, really what self consciousness looks for. It it does seem to tend to kind of presuppose that there is some grand solution. Yeah. Um, I wanted to add this example a few times um, throughout this, and I was like wondering. I don't like to bring up too many uh, pop cultural references in a single thing because it feels like homework for everybody at this point in the world of streaming, where there's so many options, but. Uh, Fleabag. Fleabag is a two season show that came out a couple years ago. Um, and it was written, directed, and starred in by uh, Phoebe Waller Bridge. And she's she's a genius. She has a very, uh, if she doesn't have a Lacanian basis, then she has some kind of a psychological basis that gets close in various ways. Um, and I don't want to spoil anything. I just want I want people to realize that there's more to the show than you might think in the pilot. Like you might think all she's doing is subverting the male gaze with looking at the camera and breaking the fourth wall all the time. It's not true. There's something really interesting going on here. Um, but it's a good example. She definitely sees herself as a liberated woman who's just living a sex positive life. And as mm. the show goes on, you actually find out about the lack that she's unable to confront. And it's, and it's kind of wild. Yeah. Often we have more honest representations of the real of sexuality in stories. Like if you study stories or narratives, uh, movies, books, oftentimes, I mean, if they're well done, um, obviously not like just like a childish fairy tale or like a rom-com or something like that. Usually, I mean, even in the rom-com, like what the actual story of the rom-com is circling around is the, the way in which sexuality doesn't really work, you know, like where something's off, you know, like there's, there, you know, there's a trying to get together. Like even I'm thinking about like, for example, in The Office, you know, the show The Office with Jim and Pam, you know, like The Office was at its peak when Jim and Pam were kind of like in this ambiguous tension, right? Like they're not yeah. together, like they want to be together, but they can't be together. And there's all these like barriers in the way of them being together that's what's interesting in the story like that's that's and that's what and that's what makes you interested in in continuing to watch it this is this is also i think the the, the core of like every seth rogan film you know yeah, yeah that seth rogan yeah. is like the perfect embodiment of the lack of lack at the core of sexuality yeah you know. yeah. yeah and and of course like we mentioned game of thrones it's just like it's interesting like to me what's fascinating is after moving through psychoanalysis is the way you watch movies and read books like is totally transformed. And I think that's also something that like marks obviously Slavoj Žižek's career. Like Slavoj Žižek is a master at like 
bringing out the interesting dimensions of the sexual failure in narrative like for example the like his commentary on titanic like i brought up before you know like the the metaphor of you know jack and rose's story and hitting the iceberg and actually if it didn't hit the iceberg they would have been in new york and probably been a miserable couple because rose would have had to go down in class to jack's level you know and actually exactly. the fact that jack died is a good thing because she can just remember oh the romance of uh, being on the ship for a few days with Jack. And he ties that into failed revolutions, right? If the revolution didn't fail, then we would have seen it become this, this other thing. And so, yes, you know, it keeps the hope alive when it fails. Um, I, I, uh, I want to touch on a page actually, just to tie into the, the, the slide, you have the true question, not petty little family story structures, but the gap that drives these structures and this ties into the previous slide as well, because it's all from the same part of the conclusion, which is on page, oh, geez, uh, 142. One, yeah, okay. The one where I'm at, yeah. So the, the previous paragraph ends at the top of this page uh, where it says, moreover, for the, inquis for the inquisitive infant, sexuality is often bound up with stories and myths, embarrassment and avoidance, sometimes even with disgust and punishment. And then she goes on. Now- she had said this explicitly, but it's easy to forget because I keep forgetting that, you know, sexuality, she's talking about drive and drive here. It's just as much about knowledge as it is about uh, anything we tend to associate with sexuality. And so thinking about how these stories, these fairy tales that parents tell children, that children tell each other that they, they kind of develop culturally as a way of navigating the unconscious. Um, this isn't just like, oh, storks fly to your house to drop off babies and that's where they come from or babies come from when people lay together or whatever. This is more importantly, the, the disgust, punishment, avoidance, embarrassment that generates myths and fairy tales is at the level of knowledge just as much as what we tend to think of as sex. And so this is also, you got to think about like the, the embarrassment, avoidance, disgust and punishment that comes with becoming subjectivized into language itself, trying to speak, trying to speak and being misunderstood. People can't hear you pronouncing the word. Children make fun of you because you can't pronounce a word. I couldn't pronounce ours for the, for like, uh, I don't know, a decade or something. And so it's like the R, like people would say, say squirrel, say squirrel. And I would just get all embarrassed and I couldn't, I'd say chipmunk. I just, I'd refuse to say squirrel. Um, or I'd say Spido, like if I, I was like, there's a Spido and then people are like, ah, ha, ha, ha. but that's just kind of a more obvious example. You know, a person with a speech impediment, that's obvious, but more importantly, it's like when you try to ask for something and then it backfires and then you're understood as asking for something you weren't even asking for, a kid can just completely melt down and, and they're devastated and they don't, uh, they don't understand what's wrong. It's, it, there's something wrong and they, they thought they they thought they had a hold on this language thing, but it's not working the way that they thought it would. This is where the big Signorelli's joke, uh, he's always sharing this Lacanian joke, comes in, which is the, the kid who goes to the, actually, Andrew, I'll let you kind of bring that up at the end. We'll, we'll, we'll get, we'll get to it. But the, uh, I guess the main thing I want to drive home here though, is that Sexuality, yeah, when, when the way we think about sexuality, it comes with awkwardness. It comes with shame, disgust, punishment, avoidance, et cetera. But she's yeah. talking about knowledge at the exact same time. And so our very being in knowledge, yeah, at our, 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 our perception, interpretation, understanding is also wrapped up in all of these things libidinally. Yeah. That's yeah, yeah, deep. exactly. And, and that's, and that's yeah. what that's what we want to avoid with the traditional academic knowledge, the traditional academic academic knowledge pretends and masquerades as if that's not the case, right? Like they, they pretend and masquerade as if they're not libidinal. Like the, and, and, and that, you know, and we're gonna get to that in the actually opening lecture of the actual course is Alenka brings up the fact that the men of science who first were exposed to Freud's ideas, they reacted against Freud like like Freud was proposing a communist revolution, like they, <laughs> they responded to Freud uh, in, in a childish way. They responded to Freud with disgust. 
they responded like, how dare you um, propose that children are sexual? How dare you propose that we are libidinal? You know, we're gentlemen, you know, we're gentlemen, yeah. we're gentlemen who have risen above sexuality, right? And that's, that's, that's basically how like the, the typical academic performs. Uh, and, and there's a certain pride, let's say, um, about, um, you know, being above our, let's say, base instincts. All of this gets complicated in Alenka's work, and we're going to have time to go into in the ways these are these these distinctions are complicated. Um, but the overall point here, as it relates to the conclusion, is I think super important, precisely at the level of both the progressive deconstruction of the traditional family and the conservative reification of the traditional family. Is that what you want to think about is you can't just get rid of family like a naive leftist would try to do. We have to have a leftist theory of family that includes a gap, but we also can't just reify the traditional conservative family too strongly. So there's a way in which we have to navigate both the progressive critique and deconstruction of the family, and we have to navigate the reification of the conservative family. And we have to have the gap and the singularity at the center, which drives these structures. Because if, if the gap and the singularity is not at the center of these structures, these structures become either um, a uh, childish polymorphous perversity on the left side, or a um, too disciplinarian authoritarian uh, conservatism. Right, where, where the father is really a father and the mother is really a mother, so to speak, right? So it's very nuanced. I think it's very difficult to language this, but at the same time, I think we have to language this because these um, caricatures of like the childish polymorphous perverse left or the overly authoritarian right uh, are real problems. So, so we, we might as well mm -hmm. take them seriously and try to think them through and try to develop languages which might be more playful with the gap. And at the same time, taking responsibility for the gap. Because what is at stake in the gap? Well, the child is at stake in the gap. Where do children come from? <laughs> and so forth. The child is, is, is actually, and so the left becomes childish and the right becomes overly authoritarian and neither serves the child, which is, I think, where we want to be thinking uh, in the end. Right. So covering nothing uh, in the same way that Alenka puts the gap at the core of the emergence of family structures. Um, she also uh, identifies that this way in which, quote unquote, traditional culture uh, creates a ban about sexuality is one, she says it's not self-explanatory why this is the case. And secondly, that it covers nothing. And this is like the unique way in which the Slovenian school and Alenka's work um, is more sophisticated, is I think a more robust and sophisticated form of, let's say atheism. Okay, let's not get too hung up on that word. But what we're trying to point towards with that word is the fact that, let's say, the Richard Dawkins or the scientific form of atheism, um, it basically engages with religion and God as if they're nothing. But the way in which the Slovenian school is dealing with nothing is much more real, where there's a real to nothing. It's not just God and religion are nothing. It's that God and religion are covering nothing, right? Like the, it's, it's really a, an accent, like we're putting an accent on the nothing, like we're actually taking care of the nothing is important. It's this, this, this actually comes from the Hegelian tradition where of course in the science of logic, what's at the core of the science of logic is the unity of being and nothing, right? So. Basically, Hegel's move in the science of logic in its simplest explanation is that in order to really become in the modern world, we have to unify being and nothing. If you don't unify being and nothing, you're not going to, let's say, truly become. 
Um, and that and that's basically what's at stake. And on the one side, you know, you can develop traditional stories and myths, uh, like Alenka says, religious or otherwise, which mask the lack of an explanation for the sexual origin. Or you can just not take nothing seriously. Um, and that would be on the more scientific side. And the reason why the so-called more scientific side would not take nothing seriously, that sort of comes from the logical positivist tradition. So in the logical positivist tradition, you only take seriously the positive content of being. You don't take seriously the fact that atoms are in a void, right? You just think about atoms and you don't think about the fact that the condition of possibility for atoms is the void. And you treat that void as a, a real, it has an ontological real to it, right? So, and, and, and that's, right. that's, so that's basically the way in which, uh, that, I mean, this is, this is why for me, the science of logic is so important is because at the core of logic, being and nothing are actually connected. Yeah, and they, they for, you know, for, for me, I think my, I have a much stronger basis in Heidegger and Lacan at this point than I do in Hegel. And that's kind of been the focus of the last few months here is getting a better understanding of first Zizek's Hegel and then kind of going back to Hegel after having read him like years and years ago. But that was one of the things that stuck with me from the first reading of the phenomenology of spirit was the idea of determinate negation, right? Yeah. And how I think Mikey had at one point said that for continental philosophy, you know, it's not just we're trying to understand so you know society. And, and subjectivization within a society, which is something analytics don't deal with. But more importantly, yeah. in the sense of, of negativity, they all take negativity seriously, except for, say, Deleuze. And, and obviously the fact that he's overcompensating in the other direction is because of the milieu he's in, which is, so that's a form of determinate negation as well. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, but the basic point I want to uh, say here is, you know, negativity, saturating or informing everything. Uh, perfect example of it is, is you, you could empirically focus on everything a person tells you about themselves, as well as everything that can be, you know, understood by the causal mechanisms and relations that have gotten them to this point. And you're still missing so much, if not the most important things about them, which are going to be things about failures to actually live up to certain ideals, uh, or not a better example, it's not death as perishing, like bodies that fall over and die. It's the fact that death is an existential, it, it, it has an existential reality for us, right? It's, it's not that, oh, at some point I die. It's that that negativity of that possibility is present all the time, right? That's right? And so, yeah, negativity. No, no, it's, it's so it's true. Yourself. And I think like, yeah, I mean, you could go on a little bit about that, but like basically what Alenka is saying here is that traditional cultures are different responses to this. And we could say that, yes, traditional cultures are a bit unconscious about this. And the question is, what does politics and theology look like after psychoanalysis? What do politics and theology look like when we have a more reflexive understanding of the unconscious? I think that is really at stake. You know, there's, there's a guy I follow who says the church needs therapy, right? Like, and, and I think like, like in regards to like his project of like, you know, he does a podcast about the church needing therapy. And it's like, like it's an example of a type of project, which I think um, we need to explore. We need to think about it because it's, it's not like, you know, like, for example, if we continue to build out our projects and stuff like that, it's not like we aren't going to need something like a, a, a meaningful political structure or even, you know, rituals, which will have a certain, you might want to say, a, a, a religious dimension to them. Um, we don't necessarily need to use those words, but at the same time, um, it's not like, traditional politics and traditional religion were uh, just uh, a mechanism of control and subordination and, and exploitation and manipulation. 
uh, they're actually speaking to something which is deeply important for the unconscious, which is for Alenka's point of view, some sort of response to the problem of our origin uh, as it relates to sexuality and knowledge. So, and, 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 that, and it makes sense, right? Because if you think about Christianity, what's the origin story? We have Adam and Eve. It's a story about our sexual origin. It's a traditional myth, which is trying to engage the mystery of sexuality, right? So it's, it's, not, it's, not just, it's not just random that that story is so fundamental to our culture. It's not just random. It, there is meaningful psychological information in those stories. And um, actually in this conclusion, Alenka says the different interpretations of the Adam and Eve story in different Christian traditions have a, a wealth of meaningful information about our response to this negativity. All right. The conclusion we can draw from all this would thus be the following. Whenever it comes to social, cultural, or religious covering up of sexuality, we can be sure that it never covers up simply what is there, for example, the sexual organs, but also, and perhaps primarily, something which is not there. It also covers up some fundamental ambiguity, which is from the outset of a metaphysical order. In other words, the more we try to think the sexual as sexual, that is, the more we try to think of it only for what it is, without censorship or embellishments, the quicker we find ourselves in the element of pure and profound metaphysics. So Dave, I'd be interested in your take on this from a Heideggerian point of view. Um, but like what, what I take of this as most important is the fact that many social, cultural, religious coverings up of sexuality are covering up a fundamental ambiguity of sexuality. The, the fact that we can't pin it down, the fact that we can't make it real, the fact that we can't actualize the perfect being. And what happens in that ambiguity is this element of pure engagement of pure and profound metaphysics, um, which is, I think, you know, for me, like in my personal life is like the drive of philosophy. I'm not sure how to, so. so you don't need to say anything uh, but from a yeah. higher point of view, but I was just wondering if, if it might provoke something in you. I think, you know, I'll just do my little armchair thing instead of, I, this is not obviously going to be deeply based in him or whatever, but because you know, obviously his, uh, the Heideggerian failure to think sex is one of his many failures. I mean, he's got <laughs> more failures than successes and that's why he's so, so informative for thinking, so stimulating, really. Yeah. But um, like, no, nobody's ever been so slow, methodical, and deeply wrong, you know, to really help us along and <laughs> figure it out. But um, his, his, yeah. So, I guess the impossibility of of sex. It just makes me think about authenticity and being in time, and how that the the reason you know. The reason that it matters, there's obviously like the, the critique of it, the Adorno style critique of it. It, 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 authenticity becomes hipster shit. It becomes, oh, like I'm ahead of the curve. I'm, I'm doing this uniquely and no one else is. I'm, I'm so authentic. Heidegger says, first of all, that no one, there's no such thing as like full authenticness. You, you, you don't ever become that. Like it's, it's a process. But the point is, is that there's something about the being that asks the question about what it means to exist that is that goes beyond you know traditional ontological and epistemological uh questions when we think about the sense of the meaning of the question being asked the import of the question is in part based in the fact that we are the kind of being who can lose ourselves, right? So it's like, we have this possibility of being able to win ourselves or lose ourselves. The, the, the animals don't go hang themselves because they feel like they've lost themselves. That's very true. And, true. and they don't pull out and they don't kill themselves as a, as a political statement saying, I will not go along with this. I will not go along with what I see here. I disagree with it. I'm out. 
There are so no, that is uh, the uh, there are no Antigones in uh, the chimpanzee society. Mm -mm. Exactly, and so that that's the you know that is part one of the most important things that makes us us that that he really wants to center on. And so people tend to think about authenticity as just like, oh, are you being authentically your full self? And and they and then they'll they'll put Heidegger in this kind of camp that just believes that you can be that. No, that's not what he's dealing with. He's dealing with the fact that you can get to a certain point where you go, I've lost myself so much, there's no more point being here. Like, so so the kind of questions that philosophers are asking about what's the point of all this, what's the good life is being driven by this deeper question of like, am I losing myself? Can I, can I actually claim a life that's worth living? Right. And so um, the, so tying that all into, into sexuality in like a, a, a super rigorous way is maybe a project for me to think more about, but it, it definitely, there, there, there's rich soil here for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think it's super interesting, like to do a being and time analysis from the point of view of the unconscious or from the point of view of what, what's being discussed here. I, I don't see why it's inherently incompatible to, to try to think this. And one of the one of the interesting things that always I don't know why it's so I don't know, I experience it as so obvious in some sense. And sometimes I feel like I get a lot of resistance, especially in my academic uh, career, I got a lot of resistance to how intimate and intense the emotions of sexuality are and how underthought they are intellectually. I always thought, why is that? Like, <laughs> I'm like, obviously this is super important guys. <laughs> it's like, yeah, my, uh, but anyway, there, uh, you know, I think for me, Freud helped me uh, with that a lot, but um, it's just, you know, here we're dealing with something where obviously when we think about the most pure and profound metaphysics, like the idea of heaven, for example, uh, the idea of God, the idea of um, Adam and Eve, uh, this is pure and profound metaphysics. And obviously those concepts um, are pointing towards something which is coming from a certain energy and a certain phenomenal experience which has some relationship to the sexual feeling uh i don't think it's i don't think it's a, a stretch to um think about the genesis of these concepts in this way um but i think it's it's something that that opens at least an interesting philosophical project. All right, so uh, you notice there I got the umbilical cords covered, uh, and that's what we're going to be talking about crucially on this slide, is the distortion of the true origin. So Alenka says that there's no neutral way to talk to speak about sex. Something always gets added or subtracted beyond the facts. Um, and also artists, in terms of portraying Adam and Eve, should uh, tarried with the problem of should the first couple be port portrayed with or without navels because the navel obviously implies an ancestry we have a navel because that's obviously where the umbilical cord is covered uh when we are when we're born and obviously adam and eve typically shouldn't have an umbilical cord since they weren't born of another human being but they were created by god so there's this ambiguity here and she said it's interesting to study. This is an interesting way in which psychoanalysis impinges in theology. She says, it's interesting to study the way artists uh, dealt with this problem, right? Like where they would basically cover up both the genitals and the umbilical cord. So we just sort of leave that question shrouded in mystery, right? We, 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 don't, go, we don't go into that because it brings up a whole bunch of paradoxes about the origin. And so she says, the typical solution is that artists escape the question by extending leaves over sexual or organs in the lower belly. Now, in regards to this theological point, I just want to connect this to something that's very tangential and very common sensical in some way about the way in which we talk about sexuality is that when she says there's no neutral way to talk about sexuality, 
it's that there's always some indirectness at work in sexuality. Like the most common example would be obviously when we go on a date and if we have sex at the end of that date, it's not like you say, hey, would you like to have sex tonight? It's not like that. <laughs> you talk about everything except sex. <laughs> you talk around it, right? Even if both people on the date are hoping at the end of the date that there's sex there. <laughs> you don't direct, you don't, there's no neutral direct way to, to, to talk about it. You add other things or you subtract things. You're mysterious about it. Like you don't say anything about it. Or you add things, meaning you talk around it in a different way, right? So the, it's, it's not just you talk at the thing. And I think I've, I've talked to many <laughs> different people about this is like, in terms of like, for example, pickup artists or approaching approaching a woman, for example, you never directly talk about sex. You talk about anything except that. So again, there's no, there's, it, it's this way in which we're dealing with some sort of like formal distortion. And really the psychoanalytic point here is that the enjoyment we get in speech orbiting or driving around, you know, this, 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 point of impossibility is actually where we get enjoyment. And we, we brought that up in the, um, in the first, in the first lecture. Right. So, is there anything is, you want to jump in here with Dave? Yeah. I just say that this is part of the reason there's so much sexual anxiety today. And also in a sort of sense, zoomers might be seen as like the least sexual generation in the post you know, liberated world, right? Since the mm. sexual uh, revolution of the 1960s, the least, the least liberated generation is the one that talks about it explicitly the most that has developed this sort of idea of let's talk about everything up front. Let's put everything on the table. Let's, or on the other side, that's the more woke side. The more woke side would be, well, we're going to have a contract and we're going to read it together and we're going to sign off at oh, the yeah, end. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Whereas the other side is that's gonna, total it, repression, by the way. That's right, total, yeah. that's total repression. Which repression can be all right, but that's a that's a form of repression that actually, perhaps, well, it seems to. Okay, well, what I'm getting it, at it's it's exactly yeah. the obfuscation of the unconscious, where you, you just can't deal with the fact there's an unconscious. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Or that sex is largely unconscious, right? And you know, so it's trying to put a light on everything. And so, yeah. on the other side of it is the is the sort of just Tinder hookup culture, where it's it's um, you still get people who are flirting, who are coy, who are kind of you know burying the lead or whatever. But it's also, I mean, like uh, I'm thinking of people who I met in college who use it a lot and it was working for them and they were just very explicit about what they wanted. And uh, like, I'm thinking about this one woman who is trying to see how many people she could be with in a year. And she was uh, an artist. She was making paintings of all the penises of all the people she had been with or whatever. You know, it's just like this liberating thing for her or whatever, but you know, she, so she just get on the app and just be like, oh, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. But I also know guys who are kind of the same way, like let's fuck, let's fuck, let's fuck, let's fuck. And on both sides of that, you've got to think like they're, they're trying to, to have it, to achieve it in this whole sense, like just to get it to just, let's just, let's just do it. Let's just get to yeah. it. And what they're getting is is obviously not very satisfactory. It, it, it instantly they're instantly back on that grind because it's not bringing the fulfillment that they're looking for. And so this is one of those ways that the constitutive lack at the heart of drive, it yeah, it can manifest as as a as a obsession for knowledge, but it can also manifest as an obsession for ontic sex. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, yeah, that's that's also to me a big uh, that both both are forms of repression. Like it, it's it's a mistake to think oh just someone who's very quote unquote sexually liberated having sex with many partners. It's a mistake to think that they're actually liberated. It's probably more accurate to say that they're deeply enslaved. I guess I have a question then because I know that you've kind of said something along the lines of 
repression is not necessarily bad. In fact, we need to be repressive in specific ways. So, but it sounds like in this in this context, you're using I'm that talking about extreme negatively. Well, What's I'm that? talking about it in, in in terms of its its most extremes. Okay. Like I, I mean, it, it's it's I I also don't want to I also don't want to say that that it's. I actually don't know if it's possible to to live a life without repression at all. I mean, right. I, I don't, I don't. That might not be possible. But this this seems to be like the kind of repression that might be the most harmful, right? Ult- ultimately, ultimately, what rep- like I think to me, like what I'm talking about at the core of repression is that there's some obfuscation of the lack where you are obfuscating your deepest desire to pair to not to not to pair bond in like a tradition like in, in necessarily reification of a traditional relationship but to pair bond in the sense of your desire for the other pair bond like even if you think about repair like yeah. to repair something that's broken like it, the deepest repression is obfuscating the fact that there is something that needs to be repaired. I see. Right. So if you're just messing around with many people, you're you're basically in a spurious infinity and multiplicity. So that that way of that, like that's your res, that's your repressed response to the desire for the other in the in the deepest sense. Like. The deepest desire is for the other. And like you could say in Lacanian terminology, perhaps das Ding, the thing, the Freudian thing. Right. And 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 that's that's being repressed through polymorphous perversity, through uh just treating the other as a perverse instrument. Right. Like to, to, to make, to make, like to turn an art project into how many penises I can draw, how many penises I can, can collect in a year. You're just purely reducing the other to an instrument. Right. Well, and you know, that's, it's the, it's, it's the girl boss empowerment ver you know, version of taking on the, the giga Chad, you know, joke of the guy who's yeah. literally running around putting notches on his belt. And it's like, it's, uh, it's, yeah, anyway, so, but I guess what I'm a little confused about is that she thinks this example of the belly button, whether it was or was not there on Adam and Eve, like the debates that revolved around this, and then the decision to finally just put fig leaves over that to kind of keep it mysterious. I, I, what she, she thinks this is a really good example of how, when you cover up sex it's not just sex that gets covered up something else gets covered up something else that's not even there i, I like guess the pure I guess, metaphysics of the origin like what's getting covered up not religious. like the like what do belly buttons signify yeah that you were that you were born yeah that you were born the origin and the the it's that you encounter the if Adam and Eve had a belly button that means that they were born from another human but they weren't born from another human they were created by God. Right. So they shouldn't have belly buttons. Only their children should have belly buttons. Oh, I get I get why this was a, a I get I get why this is a, a fascinating example of a of a sort of theological problem that artists had to deal with. I don't get how this is a good metaphor for what she's trying to get at i think what she's what she's trying to get at is the way in which the human psyche struggles with the the paradox of the origin like like what it what like the origin the origin of the self where do i come from there's always there's always an infinite regress like if you think about like this in science, like with the Big Bang is like, okay, the Big Bang is the origin of the universe, but what caused the Big Bang? Right, like right. there's an infinite regress, like you, you can never get to the origin. In a Hegelian sense, like you could say Hegel solved this in some sense. Now he solved it logically, but that doesn't necessarily solve it emotionally. Because for Hegel, every immediacy, the paradox is that every immediacy or origin 
is always already mediated. So in some sense, that solves the problem. But on an emotional level, I think on the level of the unconscious, I think still people struggle with this. And I think that in regards to our contemporary culture, how we should think about this is that our sexuality, which used to always be nested within a traditional structure aiming towards reproduction. And this is really the crucial thing. In traditional culture, our sexuality was always constrained in a system towards reproduction, which is the origin. Now we have a system where sexuality is totally disconnected from reproduction. And so the question of the origin is in some sense that much more anxiety producing. Because people forget that actually what's at stake in your sexuality is the status of the future and the child. And I think we've lost all traditional mythological stories which sort of constrain sexuality towards that direction. It's also not a mistake that in Christianity, the child is so front and center, like specifically the story of Jesus. What she's trying to say is that all of these theological structures are not random. They reflect, they reflect the curiosity of actually the, 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 and the mystery of the sexual instinct. They're, they're, they're different metaphysical responses to the mystery of our um, self-reproduction and self-origin in the sexual drive. And ultimately, mm -hmm. again, with Hegel, the origin is all, the immediate origin is always mediated. So in some sense that solves things, but again, emotionally, not really. Okay, so we'll go on to the, to the, to the next slide. Uh, so from, and this is I, one of the final slides, but from Adam's navel to the dream's navel is this is ultimately, I think what she's trying to point towards Dave with the Adam's navel is she's trying to connect this to the psychoanalytic theory of the origin of the dream itself. Uh, and and, and the, 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 the interesting idea of the dream's navel or the birth of the dream. So she says, myths and fantasies about procreation and the origin cover the absence. Like for example, the theological theories of Adam's navel. And the navel is obviously a scar left by the lapse of being, the sexuation reproduction. So it's, it's kind of like thinking about not says scare there, but it should say scar. But it's basically the belly button is a scar. And this is really important for Lacan, a scar uh, by the fact that we are sort of subordinated to the chain of sexuation and reproduction. Um, that when it says there's no ontological dignity, what's the story in Christianity which tries to give ontological dignity? It's that we originated in God. That, like, to the Christian, that is ontological dignity. It's not just there's a gap there. It's that there's God there. That's dignity. We have an ontological dignity. There's, there's the truest realist being there. Not just the gap, right? But for psychoanalysis, it's all about dealing with the psychological uh, difficulties of, of, of being subordinated to this chain of reproduction, right? Like maybe, you know, if you study the origin of Freud's writings, for example, what you find is like women who are struggling with like wanting to kill their baby and stuff like that. Like it's basically, you know, in this crisis of the social structure, which is trying to uh, constrain people to this, uh, submit people's egos to this uh, chain. Right. And now I think that we've been released from this chain in some sense. Uh, now we have obviously problems of narcissism. It's like the ego gets out of control. Uh, the ego just tries to endlessly consume objects. Right. So what we're trying to do is think about some more self-reflexive, some more mature way to deal with this situation. Um, of course, from a Freudian point of view, religion is sort of childish. Now, Lacan complicates that picture, and I think that contemporary philosophers are also trying to complicate that picture, but nonetheless, it's, it's sort of an example of where psychoanalytic knowledge, um, you know, starts. Ultimately, here, the Freudian unconscious with the dream's navel, and we're going to get into a specific interpretation, is basically 
what's at stake with the unconscious is learning about the origin of the dream itself because for Freud, what constitutes our sexuality is the dream, the fantasy, right? The way we dream and the way we fantasize about the other is fundamental you know, to, to psychoanalysis. And it's never just two biological bodies having sex, right? It's, it's, yes, there's biological bodies, but more importantly, their biological bodies conditioned by fantasy conditioned by dreams, conditioned by dreams and fantasies, which are specifically about the other or Das Ding or the origin. So here's a, a quote. Speaking of navels, in Freud, the interpretation of dreams, the famous as well as curious expression, the dream's navel, related to the whole in the very net of knowledge. There is often, a, this is a quote from Freud, there is often a passage in even the most thoroughly interpreted dream, which has to be left obscure. This is because we become aware during the work of interpretation that at that point, there is a tangle of dream thoughts which cannot be unraveled and which moreover adds nothing to our knowledge of the content of the dream. This is the dream's navel, the spot where it reaches down into the unknown. So ultimately what, what Alenka is trying to do here is say that what psychoanalysis teaches us is to become more comfortable or to become more, to become more stable, I suppose, in the unknown. Like to stop using knowledge to defend ourselves against the unknown, to stop using knowledge to defend ourselves against instability. We can't find stability. We can't find a final ground in knowledge there's an unconscious and that unconscious ultimately is related to the unknown and the birth and the origin. And it's almost the more we become again, comfortable with the unknown, almost the more we can, I don't wanna say enjoy our dreams, become more empowered in our dreams. I don't know what the right word is, but to become more, more conscious of our dreams perhaps, what, what's coming up for you, Dave? Well, if this includes daydreams, right? That's, that's also really important because it's, I, I, have we talked about this before? Did we maybe talk about this in the introduction? The idea that like, it's, it's kind of easy to tell, here. right. It's easy to tell people about your dreams, but it's a lot harder to tell people about your daydreams because you kind of instantly realize how foolish they might seem to other people. Um, and they, they, they come with a lot more vulnerability because there's a lot less plausible denial because you're seemingly conscious while you're having them, seemingly conscious while you're having them, right? But those, those daydreams in a lot of ways are related to our fundamental fantasies, right? And those Absolutely. might be very childish, very childish fu fundamental fantasies. But if we don't come into like a sort of relationship of critical relief to those, if if we can't kind of become more comfortable with the fact that we have drive and also realize that those fantasies are inherently unfulfillable, um, then we'll drive ourselves crazy. Right. Yeah. And I think a lot, and I think uh, for Alenka, at least, you know, I think she finds a lot of adults are crazy and that we just normalize the crazy, like what we yeah. call a normal, what we call a normal adult identity is actually crazy. Right. Um, I, so I think psychoanalysis does point towards that. Um, at least for me, I think it's it's really important to pay attention to your to your dream, your fantasizing when you're like on the edge of sleeping and waking as well. Like when you're just like getting up in the morning, like if say you're like sleeping in, like I find that my fantasies while I'm sleeping in are like really intimate. And mm. it's like important to like become like comfortable I like I almost feel like it's important to become comfortable with those fantasies even to be able to talk about those fantasies um because to me they point towards something very intimate and they point towards something very precious even if the adult even if most people might consider them I don't know 
like something you should stop thinking about or something you should repress precisely because you should just get up and get on with your day and get onto the metro. Right. Get like, back to work. Get back to work. Yeah, exactly. Don't spend too much time thinking about that in-between space of waking and sleeping. Get back to work as quickly as possible so you can burn yourself out and then go back to another unconscious dream. Because I think if you just pay attention to what's really going on on the border between your waking and your sleeping life, what, what Freud would call the pre-conscious, I think you're actually, you know, that's as close as you can get to the root of the unconscious itself. And again, what's at the root of the unconscious is just the unknown. So it's like, get, get out of this, like, get out of this tendency of self-consciousness to try to find the positive thing, which ends your search for the thing. Right, like there's always that drive in self consciousness or that desire in self consciousness, as I say, to find the object which is the thing, you know. And and I think that the more like you realize in psychoanalysis, actually, the thing is actually the unknown, which is a positive thing that it's just an absence there because that allows us to be in a process, I guess. All right, nice. so this is the final slide and then we'll, we'll open it up. So the unknown, uh, Alenka says the term, she wants to, uh, what she's trying to do here at the end is trying to bring the category of the unknown into her onto epistemology, into her short circuit. Like that the short circuit is the unknown. So she says, not simply unknown in our knowledge, not just simply we don't know self-consciously, but that there's an unknowing in being itself. And so there's this, again, this relation to the onto epistemology and the gap that we don't know human knowledge because there is nothing to know being itself. So there's this idea that even drives like classical science, which is that there's some being to know. Like I'm even tempted here, Dave, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm even tempted to say that like, this is pathologizing Heidegger. Like Heidegger wants to know the being, the being with the big B. Mm -hmm. And it's like what Alenka is saying is we don't know being with the big B because there's nothing to know. There is nothing. <laughs> there, there, there's, no, there's, no, there's no positive being there that, 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 as it were, we could fill in with knowledge. So She's saying there's an irreducible crack registering a negative knowledge. And this is the positivity, this negative knowledge. And this is for Alenka, the, the discovery of the Freudian unconscious. And so to me, that's very interesting in the context of just having taught the science of logic, because in some sense, what Hegel's logic rests on and depends on is this negative knowledge, because it's always being nothing, being nothing, being nothing, being nothing. Right? It's not being being it's not being qua being it's being qua nothing and that's what allows becoming mm. and so there's all sorts of dialectical mediation which goes on in the science of logic which is resting on that foundation i guess the uh it's it is the heidegger that spends his later years focused on trying to really get at being that i'm Prob and and doing so mostly poetically that I'm, you know, not very, I, I don't know. I don't get a lot from it. What I think is most important is his, his question about the pre-ontological uh, itself, which is like what comes before we do ontology, right? Cause he says, you know, people will focus on ontology, metaphysics, epistemology, uh, ethics, but philosophers have lost their sense for being. And if we are to really ask that question, well, first we have to ask, what is the sense of that question? And so Being in Time is not the book of trying to figure out what is being. It's a book of trying to figure out what is the sense of the question itself, who's asking it. And so that's why I like it so much is because it is a lot less focused on this uppercase being, which is not my cup of tea really but i mean it's it's an important question because it is insinuated in every sentence we ever utter right everything we say anything we signify relies on um 
saying words like is, and obviously there's different senses to these words and those usually don't get thought through. And so, you know, it's a fundamental, it is an important question, but yeah, no, I, I, I agree though, that, that, that this does, I, I think it really does pathologize, especially later Heidegger. Yeah. Well, it's, it's certainly something to investigate. I, 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 you know, I just temper, temper what I'm saying here by, of course, I'm, I'm not an expert on, on every philosopher. I'm not an expert on every form of knowledge. Just here, I guess what I would say is from a psychoanalytic point of view, um, the, the claim would be that pre-psychoanalytic philosophy and pre-psychoanalytic science and pre-psychoanalytic religion have to, in some sense, tarry with the discovery of the unconscious. That's, that's I guess, the, the, the major psychoanalytic point. And I think Alenka here is trying to, to, to bring this to our attention specifically, I'll say, and I think what will be most important throughout the course is to think the political implications of this. And I think that's, that's really what the Slovenian school brings to us. You know, because like, people can say, look, the Slovenian school is really difficult. It's really confusing. What are they talking about? I think what they're talking about are the political, the socio-political implications of the unconscious a lot of the time. And I think that that's, that's really important for our moment. So it's, it's, I think, one of the reasons why I'm, I'm attracted to that. So, all right, so that's the conclusion. Um, it's been two hours, so thank you for ever. It's, it's, I think, one of the reasons why I'm, I'm attracted to that. So, all right, so that's the conclusion. Um, it's been two hours, so thank you for everyone who's been here. Um, it's been um, great to, uh, to have uh, you with us throughout the entire presentation. And uh, the floor is really open here. So um, if anyone wants to, I think we should just raise hands, I think, um, if, you're, if you wanna speak, but floor, floor is totally open. I, I do wanna just preface things with one, oh, do you wanna, one thing. Do you wanna, should, we do the, should we do the big? Yeah, we should. Uh, but I was just gonna say that, listen, if, you're, if you've been watching this and you feel like you have a really dumb question, like that you can't stop asking um, and it's, it feels like it's too dumb to actually bring it up. I just really want to encourage you to bring it up. The, I try to model that. I try to ask my dumb questions as much as possible. Um, that's that's my role really is to be the, the, the village idiot here. Um, but I can't always get at everything that you might be tripping on. And so I really want to encourage people to kind of try to articulate their, their confusion in their own ways if they have any. But yeah, now let's talk about the talk about the big news. What is it, Cadell? Well, well, I mean, it, it's it's I have to I have to first give I mean, there's a big reveal just because uh, this is a lot of what I mean, this is this is your uh, I think your big reveal because it's 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 happening because of you. Yeah, but, I mean, well, so I was, already, I was in dialogue with Alenka Zupancic about some other things. Um, and then I had to tell her that we're teaching this course and everything like that. And so we we're talking about it. And I said, you know, I know that the people who are taking this course would just absolutely love an opportunity to meet you, right? Because we did that with Catherine Liu. We've done that with a couple of other guests where it's like after it's over, um, we go offline and then the class actually gets a chance to to meet, to introduce themselves, to ask questions, to talk about their project proposals, et cetera. And so um, she was like, oh yeah, that would be great. Let's do it. And so the, the the big struggle for the last two months has been pinning down a time that actually works, but we got it. So that's the we're, that's we're gonna the have, we're gonna have a link in the course. And and so 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 Alenka's gonna Alenka's gonna be joining us. We're gonna have a we're gonna have a session with her where uh, what's the structure, Dave? Is is we're gonna come on for for two hours? Yeah. So the so it'll be on June tenth at um, I think at five p.m. Central European time, which is eleven a.m. Eastern time, which is what is it, eight a.m. Pacific time. So it's pretty much doable by everybody in the U.S. and Europe's times. I hope it's doable for people who are elsewhere. Maybe you'll have to join in the middle of the night. But basically, yeah, the first hour will be done as a live stream where the two of us 
talk to Alenka about what we've been doing, the course, how it's developed, and we ask her questions and get her to elaborate. Really, the, the goal is to kind of do an interview lecture where we both kind of egg her on. And then um, after the first hour... What's that? I think there was just someone who came on and there was an audio, but I, I muted. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So yeah, basically, uh, it'll it'll be great. I'm I'm really excited about it. The the last hour will be offline, and uh, everybody who's in the course is going to be able to meet her. Right. So I think it's it's a fantastic opportunity. Um, I had a chance to meet Alenka once. She's fantastic. She's very relatable, and I think that most importantly, having a class engaging with her work at this depth and being able to ask her directly questions inspired from this text is such a unique opportunity. Um, so yeah, I mean, I just think this is so cool. So great job, Dave. Uh, and, and that's really, really, really his, his, uh, it's, uh, it's all, all because of his work. So one of, one of the exciting, one of the exciting things that comes out of an opportunity like this is the opportunity to get a symbolic mandate from the author, one of the authors you're engaging with. So like Mikey's been writing his first major work uh, for the last five years because of something Slavoj Žižek told him, just go do it. Um, and Anne, when she met Catherine Liu, she told Catherine about what she's thinking about writing. And Catherine was like, that is so badly needed. We really need that. And so it's pretty cool. So basically what you're thinking about writing as a, as a, as a piece from yeah. your engagement with what is sex you're we, while there's still a, a one remaining lecture in the course, you'll have this opportunity to kind of run your idea past her, you know, and kind of we'll kind of play with it, you know, in the conversation. So, yeah, yeah, no, it, it's 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 gonna it's gonna be fantastic. I'm super looking forward to that session, and um, no, I think I think um, my 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 feeling has been since wrestling with this book back in when it was first released is that like and you know the political discourse on sexuality just seems to get more polarized and worse as as things go along is that, that this is really needed so I'm, I'm happy that there are people interested in engaging the question and uh, happy we can dedicate the next few months to it So if there are if there are any we can I mean Dave you and I can just riff but uh, Andrew what what's going on what's going on for you how 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 do you uh, relate to this do you want to jump in here Big Sig yeah sorry I was trying to unmute myself um, yeah so I really liked how so as you all, like as you know and Dave knows um, and I don't know anybody else in the chat but we recently the the vanishing mediators the channel that I co-host with uh, Nick Freebeer tomorrow we recently had a discussion with Isabel Millar on her psychoanalysis in, uh, of AI which I just got my physical copy today so I'm excited but uh, I really like how you could kind of see there's a parallel between two works at one, we're, we're going over um, the short circuiting of, as you pointed out, the onto um of, of sex and like its radical negativity. But I think what my interpretation of Malar's work is that with the concept of the sex bot and the AI is that we get this extimate relationship with grappling with the Kantian antinomies, right, of sexuation. Well, the Lacanian antinomies of sexuation, but in a Kantian lens and applying it to something that is a, a concrete phenomenon with technology and how technology, artificial intelligence, rather than this whole paranoia of like, oh, like art artificial intelligence is just going to take over humanity and wipe us out clean. It's more of like, well, what does artificial intelligence tell us about uh, human essence, right? And rather than just like the analytical tradition of like someone like John Searle, like using the Chinese experiment, someone like, um, who's a phenomenologist, uh, Hubert Dreyfus, that like is like, oh, uh, you know, humans are not robots type thing. Well, they're only seeing it from a cognitive uh, and even analytic lens of like, oh, can it do epistemology? Can it, can it ask about truth? She's like, well, can it enjoy? Can it fuck? 
then that's the main thing that it's like, we're not reduced down to that, but it's the question like, what is enjoyment and how this is like her notion of the sex bot uh, is the seventh paradigm of Jewish songs. And so kind of seeing these two hand in hand, you could see two different projects bring about the same inquiry of, in a sense, being put in an irreducible gap. And that's where we should aim from. Um, and I put in the, the uh, comments about uh, the theory of seduction, which was a, a theory that Freud got a lot of scrutiny of, um, which was like pretty much that like usually the entrance into sexuality comes from like a traumatic encounter um, from the adult, right? Uh, and it kind of also brings a parallax as Zizek brings this up because Laplanche re-resurrects the term seduction theory from Freud, but uh, the, the gaps between uh, infantile sexuality and adult sexuality, it's not that either one is innocent and one is more mature, but rather they're both in this like contradiction. And I put in how like now we could see how the adult is supplemented for the encounter with pornography and like how that stimulates this traumatic encounter with infantile sexuality or just sexuality in general, but also creates that gap of, of knowledge and being because what is porn, but nothing but a, a simulation, a fantasy, a hyper reality, but that hyper reality definitely creates like a sort of mark for uh, what we have to give up in entering into the symbolic order. Right. And so I wanted to know what you kind of thought about that. Cause that's something that I've been riffing off about. Like when you really think about how child uh, sexual development theory operates in psychoanalysis and how we could apply it today, but then also critiquing the sort of, oh, kids are just so pure. They don't know anything. They're innocent. Well, when you look at kids play with Barbies and GI Joes, there's already this polymorphous perversity being mapped on onto a mediation of toys. It's like oh, yeah. right then and there, there's a substitution via the toys. And it's like, that becomes an extension for them to reflect back. And it's like, oh, now I could see how this toy represents my body. And then like the way that they make them play house and kind of put themselves in weird positions that they've, oh, I saw mom and dad do. So right then and there, sexuality is already being imprinted onto the body, the speaking body. No, I, 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 absolutely. I mean, I, I especially, yeah, relate to the, the point about the way children play with toys in general, I would say, you know, but it, absolutely. And it, it's super interesting to think about pornography in that sense of the specifically the, the the infantile sexuality and what we in some sense have to sacrifice in order to enter the symbolic order like is is and it's kind of how it functions in adult identity is like it's almost like the adult identity almost wouldn't i'm assuming just drawing from my own consciousness is that most adults would experience a rupture of their symbolic identity if they had to bring their porn habits into speech. Mm -hmm. Like it would almost represent a rupture of their adult identity. <laughs> uh -huh. so this is a way in which like the, the child infantile sexuality is too close, right? It's, it's right. like you were saying, like right for adults it's like very like it's it's like again like what dave was talking about we don't want to talk about our, our our day fantasies but we talk about our dreams but kids are always in, in school you know talking about porn or like you know right. joke and disavowing the sexuality like making it a parody to kind of uh discredit the void the, uh, of of yeah. sexuality itself by kind of discharging it of its of its meaning exactly yeah, I wanted to yeah. throw Go in ahead. there that the the part of when I think about porn um, in the context of the culture war today, it is like the vanishing mediator here. And in the, in the like, think about it. You got both sides accusing the other side of being groomers, both sides accusing the other side of being pro censorship, and on both sides there are various examples of things that can be interpreted this way. And some of them are definitely, you know, abhorrent. But pornography in a lot of cases is more abhorrent if we're thinking about children being able to have access to it. So, you know, people being like, oh, should the pride flag even be in the classroom? The pride flag represents sex and gender and it gets people to start thinking about these things when they should be thinking about math. 
Um, should 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 teachers be really talking about their relationships at home when they should be teaching whatever it is? Uh, you, you get all these kinds of debates, but it's easier for a child to get on the internet and find the most abhorrent shit in the history of humanity um, than anything else. Really, it's easier than being. It's easier for a kid to find like. Uh, some bukkake scene than it is for uh, that kid to get alcohol or cigarettes, right? And so you have all of this like hysteria over, oh no, like what's going on on YouTube? Children are being shown scary images that were made to target children to give them nightmares. And so then YouTube, because it's scared of a lawsuit, goes through like this huge change in the last like seven years to make it so that there's basically a children's YouTube and there's an adult's YouTube. And it's like, okay, but they're watching it on Google and you can just Google Pornhub, right? So this is, it's it, to me, it's like crazy that this is just like kind of, like there's this whole debate going on and then that's just right over here off to the side. And it's like, ask any one of them point blank and everyone's going to agree yeah, you probably want to make it so that you can't watch pornography without like a driver's license or a credit card or something. There should probably be some kind of a verification process or something. But instead, it's like, no, it's easier than buying cigarettes. What's up, Adam? So, guys, uh, first of all, excellent uh, presentation, Cadell. Um, you know, uh, going along the line of this kind of so-called uh, segregated YouTube, this child's YouTube, um, it's actually a a very fertile territory for other hostile epistemic agents to make, uh, you know, technically passing content that is otherwise uh, the kind of content that no parent would want their child to see, depending on their ideological position. Um, and uh, because it is passing, uh, it gets through even school filters. I had a kind of a situation just this year. My child attends a hybrid homeschool uh, program where she is in the district for a couple times a week. And, you know, they showed a video to her that was, was I, I looked for the content creator. I found it was a, it's a white supremacist uh, organization that produces content that's essentially PragerU for kids. And, uh, you know, obviously the teacher was completely unaware uh, that that's what she put in front of these kids and horrified. Uh, but this kind of thing, the, the problem is that as parents, we're often reliant on the false sense of security that comes from limits that we accept, that, that we expect. We hope for these limits to work and they don't. Mm -hmm. And we need them to because it's much tougher as parents to actually educate your child about things like ideological uh, manipulation, epistemic manipulation. Um, it's very tough to, to teach these things. I have my kid all day, every day, and she's seven years old, and she has a better, obviously, a better grasp of ideology than, than most kids her age, probably most adults our age in a way, but at the same time, at that age, they don't have anything to tie that information, that knowledge to anyway. So you, you can't even rely on, oh, I can teach her, I can teach her that someone may come and try to persuade her away from me, but she doesn't know what that would even mean. Um, so relying on filters, something like Google to, to put those in place, uh, you, you are in the same, you're in the same position, really. Um, those filters are, are, are covering over all of the successful ways of getting around them. And you're not realizing it when it's, when it's there. It's like expecting that your crutch is going to work when it's not. And when it fails, it's, it's awful. Um, and it's all over the place. And so that's why this kind of conversation, though it is abhorrent to most people thinking about the, the sexual, the sexuation of children, for example, the sexual, uh, understandings of children that kind of thing it's abhorrent to most people um but it's that very abhorrence that stops them from doing the things that are necessary to actually protect for example protect their children which is to empower them to make them aware of themselves um, but that's where i'm at 
Yeah, I mean, to me, as someone who doesn't have children, but would like to have children at some point, and listening to parents talk about the, the difficulty with enforcing limits and, and boundaries in the current landscape is, sounds like, like the biggest nightmare. It's, it's, it sounds like something, it's just like, oh my God, what am I, what, what am I getting myself into with, with, with a child? And, and, and specifically with, like, I think we didn't bring it up in the, and unfortunately, I don't think it comes up too much in the book, but maybe Dave and I should make a point to bring it up is the ubiquity of screens and, and, and surfaces and our attachment to screens. And of course we're on a screen right now and just, yeah, basically the entire unconscious is available to everyone at a search. So, you know, this is something which I do think also would be an interesting topic to explore if anyone's interested in writing about what is sex in the current current and to, to bring something innovative to the, the topic. I think we do need to talk about screens, surfaces, the unconscious, digital unconscious being just available uh, at the click of a button to everyone and like how much is this disrupting our planetary consciousness because it's like uh it's very weird to think about it but like it's like billions of people have access to all of this i mean without you know restriction oftentimes i mean we could talk about china and the way china deals with restricting information i mean but that's precisely why i think um, Alenk is correct to point out that sexuality has political implications, you know, and, and I think Dave, Dave's already pointing towards that is like, how do we think about this politically? Right. I, I don't think that conversation is really had. And it, to be honest, it's, it's strange that it's not being had. I see Philip's joined us. Darian, you've been with us. Nate, what's up? Been with what's us. up? What's up? Yeah, Philip, I, I think if you want of, to jump in of, here, any, yeah, anyone? Yeah, yeah. One, of, one of the hardest things, I think, is to uh, find any kind of common ground to talk about this stuff. Um, and like Alenka, one of her things um, is like even going into how speech is a sexual act. And I think that's interesting. Like even bringing that up is like, really hard for some people because they're like what no no i just talk to talk and what you were talking about with screens uh reminds me somewhat of like what baudrillard talks about with like even a close-up of a human face i think he says it's the same as like the close-up of genitals and like the act of pornography is an admission of the disappearance of sexuality itself um so it's like what she's getting at is uh i think like something that and, and maybe you and dave know more about this but my question is like do we have any idea what sex is i know that's not like anything you could no. say like short short and sweet but i guess um no i think i i mean it's it's in some sense the question since it's even kind of the name of the book and of course she doesn't say like in a sentence this is this is what sex is but what she's what she's pointing towards of what sex is is kind of she always is pointing towards sex's relationship to absence but an absence which is determining form so like like if you think about like like let me just say like something like very simple is like, if you think about like the ideal masculine body, or if you think about the ideal feminine body, these are both forms, like at their most elementary, they're forms, but they're, for Alenka, they're both forms that are responding to the absence of the complete sexuality, right? Like it's almost like if, this, if the sexuality were complete, it's almost as if humans wouldn't even exist. It's almost like humans exist because sexuality is incomplete and our masculine forms, our feminine forms are responses to this incompletion. Like that's my starting point for thinking about it, I think. And I see Chitans just jumped in as well. Nice to see you Chitan. For, for now, I would just say that drive is one of those things that it's in the real, so it's not something that can be integrated. It's only going to cause short circuits. 
but we can catch glimpse and we can symbolize it, but then it's going to move again. It'll always be on the move. And so it's that, it's like that floater at the corner of your eye you're trying to look at, you know? Um, it's, it's, you know, uh, thinking and understanding in a way that's not just like we're talking about completely removed from your body, completely removed from the world, completely out of touch with everything. Thinking and understanding then is always going to be kind of in pursuit of that thing, but it's, it's yeah, it's not going to have a lock on it. But I think the main thing though, was just realizing, cause I told Mikey on the phone, I was like, this text is just driving me crazy. Cause like her, her usage of the word sexuality, I know what she says and I know, I, I know how to answer a quiz question. Like I could get a good grade saying this is what she means, but it doesn't click for me why it's so important. <laughs> and he was just like, just, just don't worry about it. Just keep, we've been talking about drive for years. Just remember that this is drive and don't use the word sex drive. Cause if you say sex drive, then you're instantly thinking about American terminology, like, you know, with all of its connotations. No, just think of drive in its more elaborative sense. And that is what she's talking about. And I found that well, really death, useful. Death drive. Right, exactly. Like, like that, that's why sex is related to this absence. Like, I also exactly. think about it in the context of like, in philosophy and religion with like, like specifically in regards to this desire for perfect form, like Plato's ideas, perfect ideas or like God is what God is a perfect being. Like, it's almost like we're pointing towards the absence of sex. <laughs> it's like, and, and, and like, and if you think about like, especially like, I want to say immature relationships, but maybe that's not the right word is like, people can't stand any deviation from perfection. Like if there's an imperfection in the partner, if the partner did something wrong, if the partner uh, did something that violated your expectations or anticipations, it's like a big problem, like, because it's imperfect. Like, it's almost like you've stained, it's almost like it's tainted. That's good. I know like for me, like when I compare like my first relationship with my current relationship in regards to how I deal with imperfection, it's like night and day. Like in my first relationship, it was like everything had to be perfect. I had to pick her up at the right time. We had to go to the right restaurant. You know, we had to, you know, I had to, the first kiss had to be just right. Whereas like there's much more room for imperfection once you've sort of processed sex as an absence, as a, once you've included disruption into it. Like it doesn't have to go by your plan. It can surprise you. You can be surprised by it and that surprise can be positive. It doesn't have to be everything by the book, by exactly how you want it to be. And that's related to desire and drive because desire is what you want it to be and drive is open to, you know, something that's beyond yourself. Right. I really like that. And like with the whole thing about uh, speech is fucking, it's like what Lacan says, the moment I'm not uh, fucking, I'm talking to you. And yet I get the same satisfaction as if I were fucking. So the question is, am I fucking right now? It's like, I mean, like not to be crude, but like, what's like the, the shit that like, it's not about like how you perform in the bedroom, but it's like what you say before. It's like, you gotta like, you know, fuck her with your words type shit. Like, even though it's so like crude, it's like, there's kind of a truism to that. Cause when you look at the psychoanalysis, like it's in, 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 it doesn't have to be like a seductive thing. It's the fact of like, well, when you get into intellectual conversation and then like you're riffing off ideas where it's like, wow, you're making like short circuits or connections. It's not like it's a sublimation of like, Oh, like this is better than sex. Like it's no, you get the same. There's like a, a almost like they're like, in antinomies or something like that. I don't know, like, I don't have the right word to say, but pretty much it's not like one is replacing the other. It's like, they're both on the same level of enjoyment. So it puts into question what sex could be because we're not talking about a two body thing. Um, you know, we're talking about the third, as Lacan says in seminar one, when we talk about psychoanalysis, it's like, it's not a two body ego relating. There's a third body, which is that of the symbolic order or language. 
which yeah. encompasses the real because it's not a totalized thing, right? There's no meta language in the container for it. it it's broken up by its own uh, antagonisms. And, um, you know, with, with that, it's like that, that third being the symbolic order, we have to talk about a virtual other. So it's like when you were talking about like your first relationship uh, compared to like your, your last, like, like, or like your current ones, like, I think we could all agree. It's like, you know, we, we are, we're anticipating something not from the other person, but from the virtual third that is going to bring that symbolic recognition of like, this is what uh, a date's supposed to be. This is like yes. how to fit the person up. This is what sex is supposed to be. So it's not that you're performing for the other person. It's not like, I, I hope that this girl sees, or this guy sees me doing this, you know, and, and I see myself doing this, but it's that, um, you know, irreducible third, that gaze of the virtual other, it's that the is other. The Hoover. Yep. You know, that's what it boils down to of like the, you know, the contradictions of, of sex and that our sex is mediated by this virtual thing. And you can bring in Baudrillard talking about the simulation. I think it's quite fascinating. I know Millar does this in her, in her works on pat politics and stuff, but yeah, we can think of it like that. It's like, you're learning from error, but an error that's an insistence upon a super ego that says, this is how you enjoy. This is, this is how you do it. Get it right. Yeah. This is a perfect tie-in, Andrew, for you to t- to share the joke. Oh um, yeah, yeah. So so yeah, and it also goes in with seminar two because in seminar two he ties in uh, Lacan ties in uh, the super ego along with the death drive with this insistence of learning from error. So we learn from our failures, and it's like always too late, never too soon, or too early. Um, it so a, a a young boy goes into a funeral uh of a family a family after having seen him for so long so as he opens the door he says many happy returns and so he gets yelled at and beat up and he's like you're not supposed to say that you're supposed to say may god rest his soul so two weeks later he goes to a wedding and right as the groom is about to say i do he says may god rest his soul and then gets beat up and yelled at again (laughs) this is how the it's not just what we tend to think of as sex, but also knowledge, understanding, l- integration into language is riddled with complications, neuroses, shame, all of these other kinds of factors that she's talking about, right? Yeah, definitely. And I always go back to Zizek's where they don't know what they do because like, what is it? But like, we're talking about, about being, but also totality. And it's like, when we're dealing with failure and sexuality being like that negativity, it's like, we're always dealing with these like series of failed totalizations, especially along the lines of the drive. Like what is it doing, but always missing that object. And so it's this constant going back of repetition of totality, but it's always failed. It's always, uh, as Zizek says, the failed, uh, failed absolute and sex is title. Like that's a perfect way to, to think of it fragile absolute with religion, but like all these forms of totality um, that are just a series of doubling and inversions from a prior failure. We shouldn't see the mirror stage as this, um, you know, positive demarcator that's like, okay, now you're like a, a human consciousness. Now you can evolve, you know, from being a baby to an adolescent. Like, no, the mirror stage is actually a, a, a failure, a lack. And it's from that failure that we keep going on in repetition. And this is where we could compare that with Fort Da, the, the game. It's like constant totalized failures with different toys and different ways of playing that mastery of loss. I just want to acknowledge that um, we don't need to talk about it, but Darian has left a, a, a remark in the um, in the chat that I'll, uh, I, I would like to, I, I will get to, but I don't want to interrupt if uh, Andrew, you want to keep going. Okay, I just will quickly respond to, so Darian, uh, for anyone who's interested can look in the chat there. I think Darian left an interesting point I want to respond to. So first I'll tell a, a little story about um, what I'm talking about is pure repression. First, there's many stories in the United States of basically people proposing contracts which are designed to almost eliminate the chance of any failure or to eliminate the possibility of any wrongdoing 
or to eliminate the possibility of any transgression or, right? It's trying to basically make sex completely safe, trying to make sex completely interpretable to make sure that there's no gap whatsoever. And that I'm saying is pure repression. So uh, a story from my life is I was dating a girl while I was doing my doctorate who uh, was a little intimidated by me and she gave me a list of 10 rules that I had to abide by if we were to, if we were to date. And this is an example of pure repression. It's like, I don't feel, I'm too scared of my unconscious to date you. So you have to act in accordance with these 10 rules in order for me to be, feel safe. So this, this is an example of, of repression and it's in some sense understandable. I mean, it's there's some fear in approaching dating and there's some fear in approaching you know, the possibility of being hurt, uh, the possibility of being broken up with, uh, the possibility of uh, someone liking someone else instead of you. Uh, all of these things, these contrasts. So what I'm saying is the way to think about now we have to think about constraints and prohibitions creatively. And in order to think about constraints and prohibitions creatively, there has to be room for surprise. There has to be room for error. There has to be room for things to go wrong. Like they might not go perfect. You can't make sex completely safe. You can't create a safe space to use the current um, more woke jargon is like, sex is uh, messy, uh, sex is uh, not completely containable within a category, right, or a set of rules. So that's what I would say there. But also, also, if you have no rules, if you have no constraints, if you have no prohibitions, I'm saying that's also repression. So it's about navigation uh, of that uh, space, I think. Um, Chitan? Hi, wonderful conversation actually. I just, just want to think through this, this, this question of contracts and this something which I've been, you know, in a struggle with my own work because I, I remember Walter Benjamin saying it very nicely when he said that, you know, they, they, they cannot be any form of non-violence which, which, which actually eventually ends up or comes through contract in that sense. There is no contractual non-violence possible in that sense. Anything which is contractual actually has an engagement with some form of, in, in that sense, you know, they made with the sphere of violence in, in that in, in that manner. And if you, if you start thinking about this problem seriously, and I, I think, you know, in Lacan also, if you think about this question of perversion, it comes from, you know, there, there's something about a contract that it doesn't disallow or it doesn't completely bar you from a certain perverse enjoyment. There, there's something fundamentally interesting over there that it's not true that if you have this perfect contract, you, you can have this perfect form of enjoyment. These two <laughs> things never completely overlap. You know that if I can have a perfect contract and then that guarantees that my enjoyment will also be perfect. Um, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. For some reason that doesn't work. You know, I know it doesn't work. Uh, it, it, I remember discussion why it doesn't work. You know, and my, my and I, I'm not even taking as strong position schedule would take it's a perfect suppression or you know, I'm not even doing that. I'm just saying that that when you rely upon contracts to mediate something uh, which cannot be contractual by its very nature, you know, there is something very interesting this thing that emerges, which is not simply saying that the contract fails, you know, it's in the very success of that contract that something perverse emerges. Something which is, you know, uh, which you wanted to keep outside by the very nature of the contract in that sense. And, and what, 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 what do you want, how do you think through that, that kind of a problem? And that problem actually ties in very nicely with, uh, you know, what Sinarelli was sort of uh, pointing out to us in that sense that, that human beings, uh, uh, by their very nature of the, or the relationship with their unconscious actually has no guarantees or any such sort of big other possible over there to which we can get a guarantee that that our drives would only move towards life affirming you know um, tactics in that sense there is no no perfect opposition between life and that possible to, to say that you know any any rule of law that your ego internalizes, any any law that your ego places within itself as, as you know, construction of superego in that sense, uh, can actually short circuit to the aid. 
they can actually short circuit to the satisfaction of the most perverse of the unconscious desires and yeah. and you, you you may be completely feeling satisfied with them you may be feeling very happy with them uh, you know thinking that you following the law <laughs> and that that that's extremely interesting that's what you see in modern man being the modern man being a man who's who's capable of um uh, satisfying his most uh, perverse of desires that you can see that seen pornography at one side you can have a pornography at, at the click of click of your uh, mouse Now, on the other side, you have a culture which completely banishes any idea of sexual enjoyment from public sphere, and both these things sort of, you know, move <laughs> hand in hand. You know, as if we are men who doesn't who do not have sexuality as as part of our being in that sense. You know, something interesting about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I I quickly. I mean, just we can go to go to Philip, but um. I've always thought it was was very strange, you know, and and um, I, I like this remark by I forget who said it, but like if aliens came to Earth and just looked at human society from the outside, they would assume we don't have sex, right? Like <laughs> they would assume we're, we're not we're not sexual, right? Like uh, that we we keep that away. And there's something very strange about like even for example like the phenomenon of of washrooms and toilets, right? Like. We, it's almost like we try to create situations where we can pretend like we're not animals, right? Like we did everything possible to deny that we pee and shit and <laughs> all, of, all of that. This, this was uh, when you had talked about, you know, the death of God or the decentering of God, bringing about like a rise in narcissism and stuff like that. Um, I was, I was going to tie it into the part of four and they know not what they do where Slavoj riffs off of I forget which poem, which story, um, but he's basically talking about how the fear of God takes on like this master status that that uh, quilts all other fears and subordinates them, so that you're not actually afraid of anything. If you're if you're scared enough of God, and yeah. you, you all and all you really care about is not letting God down, then all of the other fears of life go away. And yeah. instead, what we have today is an anxiety culture where every little thing terrifies people. And we've never been more death averse. We've never been. So it kind of ties into what you're saying about the washroom and the excrement. It's it's all hidden. We're not animals. Yeah. And people who die, well, we send them off to a place so they can die outside of sight. And then they get put in a grave. You know, the whole death right. thing tries to get hidden away. The birth thing gets hidden away as well. Yeah. So it's just like, there's places for those things. And basically you don't talk about them in polite company and no, nobody, nobody who's trying to be a fully actualized person should even be thinking about having children, much less thinking about their grandparents who might die in the next few years. So it's just like the, the, the most important things about being a human are then the things that we're the most afraid of. And I do think that the reactions to COVID um, were a perfect example of, of this really coming to the fore. I know that's probably controversial for some people, but I just like, I'm the people who are most afraid of God, they definitely weren't afraid of COVID. <laughs> like this, is, <laughs> this was very apparent in my life because I have a lot of conservatives in my family and it's just like, they weren't bothered. They might die. They're okay with that. And it's just like, it's interesting. Yeah. Well, I think um, let's say something, but but Philip, did you wanna did you wanna jump in? Yeah, well, that kind of reminded me a little bit. There was um, a talk of yours I listened to, Cadell, that was like looking at the difference between a naive and a mature man and had to do with remaining open to the void, both with the phallic and the intellectual drive uh so it's interesting to see sometimes like how much we'll throw in front of it in front of the abyss to kind of maintain sanity and i wonder if the contract is something like that uh and this actually just like sparked an idea i don't know if you know much about batai but like mm -hmm. would he have been someone that was like kind of playing with this idea of uh repressionless um existence was because a lot of the stuff i've read from him like his diaries uh ecstasy and agony and in, in his sort of 
he was just like, you have to constantly risk your entire being like all the time. I don't know if that's like a. He's, he's like obsessed with transgression, right? Yeah. Yeah. And like um, violence as a path towards hyper reality. It kind of reminds me a little bit of that movie. What's that Oliver Stone movie like yeah. Natural Born Killers? <laughs> Where like Woody Harrelson's having that talk with Robert Downey Jr. And he's just like, it reminds me of what you were saying with Alenka and like the adults nowadays being completely out of it. And he's this mass murderer who looks at this guy who's covering him on the news. And it's just like, dude, I'm the one who's pure. Like you're the one who's messed up like creating all this and I wonder how much uh of this is like a question of moving from a child to an adult and like what the fuck that means <laughs> yeah I mean I'm not I don't I, I certainly don't want to frame this as uh I have the answers because I don't but the one of the points that I'll 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 sort of bring into the conversation is like on the one hand, we all know that like, if we just release the repetitions of like the raw unconscious in terms of like fucking, raping, killing, all of that, like we all know like that's like no, that's, that's not an option. But at the same time, if we repress that part of ourselves and pretend it's not there, then that also is sort of a hiding from ourselves. So I think we do need some constraints that are designed to make us aware of that dimension of ourselves. And to me, the word that is most um, resonates the most is sublimation, is that you want to take that killing. Like, I think actually about Andrew with like jujitsu, like jujitsu is a perfect example of taking that killing drive and, 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 you know, harnessing it, channeling it, containing it and directing it towards something which is holding a higher order tension, right? Which is like a jujitsu competition, right? Like for, for me, it was like, you know, I like baseball and football, like, and football wasn't a chance for me to go out there and hit someone, right? Like, or, or get hit, right? Like, and, but like that, like, that's a, like, that's a, and like, that's a very real drive inside of us. And, or, or like, or like, like there's a lot of guys today who are afraid of their sexuality. Like I had a friend who, for example, was too afraid to go say hi to a girl at a cafe just because, oh, that's too aggressive. So like, we have to have a way that we're in touch with that most um, aliveness inside of ourselves, But at the same time, that brings us to our own death in some sense right like so like life and death we're walking that edge you know like and and like i think chitan said there's no transcendental guarantee here or as nance said in the in the comment section capital can't articulate it so it's off limits and thus we are becoming inhuman through our denunciation of our humanity yeah i mean to some degree obviously the old folks home the coffin like the graveyard industry mm -hmm. the the hospitalization of birth, like these things are businesses. But the point is, is that the reason it can't be articulated in the general superstructure is because uh, being unto death, as well as thinking about intergenerational uh, heritage, those two things run completely counter to the, oh, everyone needs to be an individualist, you know, self-directed, you know, pleasure-seeking rational actor. You know, so good shit. Yeah, I really like that, that comparison that you made, Cadell, of the the jujitsu thing. I would like to add, like in comparison, like the distinction between what we're talking about versus the Bataille's transgression is like there's a difference between the aggressive drive and one sublimating it with jujitsu or MMA sport fighting versus like. If you ever seen that movie Man of Tai Chi, where he's like a, a very like he's like a traditional Tai Chi fighter, his master says don't do fights, but he's doing Sanda sport fights. But then he gets uh, contacted by um, you know the 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 antagonist. Um, it's played by uh, Keanu Reeves, and he's doing underground fighting for like spectators of rich people. And if the person loses, they get killed for losing the fight. So there is a difference between sublimation and transgression right there. 
And so I think that's the difference between like being this so-called repressive list, which is not really a thing. All we're just doing is being excessively transgressive versus finding that sweet spot for sublimation. I just, I just remember when I was doing the return to Freud, um, um, sort of just revisiting his text, I, I remember thinking, wow, the word sublimation keeps coming back as very useful for the foundation of ethics. And, 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 and yeah, finding that sweet spot of tension where like, I feel like we want to simulate death. Like, for example, like I always like Zizek's example of video game subjectivity, where like, if you play Super Mario, like you're actually, it's okay to die because you just go back to the, the place you, you know, at the previous point, like you fell down a pit, oh, now you're alive again. So it's like this undead drive where you can, it's okay to die. I feel like in like something like jujitsu or something like American football, it's almost like we're simulating like that closeness to death, but you're not going to die. But like in, for example, like, I don't know, like I'm for some reason thinking about ancient gladiators where like people would just literally be killed. <laughs> it's like, we don't want to literally kill each other, but we do want to simulate that uh, drive somehow. I don't know, it's interesting to think about this in the context of, of, of academics and intellectual theory as well as like, you know, I mean, in some sense, I think it functions, my observation is it functions on a metaphysical level, like philosophers could be scared of each other because they feel like, oh, this metaphysical system is gonna kill my metaphysical system. Actually, that's something that I really appreciate about Dave is like, like Dave, like, you know, you engage, like you engage, like you always say like, I'm a baby Zizekian or something like that, but like, you're not afraid of Zizekianism killing Heidegger. Like you're, <laughs> no. you're, you're you, but there are like that. Like I encounter that. Like I encounter that often, like where like theorists get defensive about who they, you know, like, are interested in because, oh, maybe my metaphysical system will be attacked. Mm. I, I would just kind of throw in there, you know, this is tangential almost, but it does tie back around to what you were saying, that this, there is this division in, in the United States, obviously between math and art, but on the other side, there's this division between uh, intellectual things and football really, or we could say athletics more generally. But one of the things I appreciate about most of my fellow travelers, they're bridging these worlds in some way. You know, you're saying that you have this background in football. Obviously, we've got some people doing jujitsu like Andrew and the, uh, or like Swole, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a personal trainer. He's got his own gym, you know? And so there's a lot of people kind of with a foot in both worlds. I love that. I wanted to say like, one of my favorite uh, professors who teaches being in time or just phenomenology and existentialism is uh, Dr. Ian Thompson from University of New Mexico. And when he was doing football in his early college days, he wasn't reading yet. And he did not, he didn't, he, did, he had no idea, right? But really his, his drive to get knocked on his ass and to get beat up and to, and to tackle things did latch on to texts, right? And so that's kind of like the conversation we just had on the marathon stream about killing ourselves with texts. Yeah. And I think that that drive, that obsessive drive is like these other things that we're talking about that can't be articulated and they get repressed or suppressed and that the it's, it's suffocating because like, like think about it, like in the music scene, like where I came from, everyone like hates bros. We don't like bros. Bros are these guys who, you know, they wear flip-flops and long shorts and they, their whole life revolves around sports and drinking and chasing women or whatever. Um, and there's, <laughs> there's like this from artistic communities, from intellectual communities, there's usually this sort of animosity towards these, these, it, it, obviously Nietzsche would call that just basically slave morality, but I just, I, I think it's, it's interesting. Cause I, I was obviously a part of all that you know, that condescension towards these things. And then it's like later through theory, I, I get, I get to a point where I'm like, oh, that's just a, we all have this need. We just manifest it in different ways. Right. And the, the, the way that a musician might, or an artist might harness that drive or express it through some outlet can be violent 
or can be harmful, you know, um, just like in football or whatever. So it's, it's interesting, but, uh, Chitan. We'll to, yeah. Yeah. Chitan. I just want to say big, big Signorelli pointing out hip hop and sublimation of wordplay is important as well. I think, uh, Chitan, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to sort of, you know, uh, frame this question myself uh, of sublimation. There's something very really interesting about sexuality that sexuality doesn't only sort of function in the domain of pleasure, you know, it, 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 it has the capacity to, you know, in some senses, always go beyond its own domains of, uh, you know, whatever, whatever boundaries you want to set for it, which, you know, which is why sexuality cannot be completely tied to reproduction because reproduction remains tied to some form of life performing. Sexuality can always overdo it. You know what you may call repetition automatism, repetition compulsion. You know those kind of words emerge because there is always something in sexuality which, 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 at least in the human sense, which which can exceed its its own purposes in that sense, and it can it can it can you know get tied directly to the dead drive in some senses. In, in, but uh, sublimation actually is a very interesting point that emerges here, that in sublimation also this excess is always there in that sense. This, this in sublimation, uh, the you know sublimation involves in some sense you know as Freud would think about in a very basic sense that directing the uh, the liminal satisfaction to you know other activities in that sense. You know, that's how you can do art, you can do intellectual work, and so on and so forth. There is always this excess liminal satisfaction that comes from you know. Um, and then a satisfaction the same in sexual satisfaction. What, what interests me is at what point this excess enjoyment, which turns into or this, which gets hooked onto duissance, actually can get converted into or that get, gets directed into some point sublimation also. There's something interesting. They both are not functioning through pleasure. It's not like they, they, they both can be simply accounted by pleasures. That is why there's always some pain involved in genuine acts of creation. Genuine points of creation involves some form of pain. They, they involve some form of, you know, uh, real struggle. They involves, and yet uh, uh, they are not simply uh, points of enjoyment where you're in, enjoying only your own, uh, in some senses, um, uh, symptoms. There, there is a possibility of creation over there. There's a possibility of natality over there. How, how do we think through this, you know, this, this very... I think I think nuts and bolts of you know or what you what you may call ethics or juicans in some senses you know um, there's something about it, it which interests me I would like to see how you think about it. Well, just say quickly because it's a big question and 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 again the way and this is sort of like me trying to enter into psychoanalytic mode after teaching Hegel's philosophy is to be more in the. Uh, there's no uh, ans final answer <laughs> type of thing uh, in that in that sense, right? Like uh, that these are like one thing I'll point towards is at the end of the last chapter of what is sex, Alenka Zupancic starts to use words like wandering excess, and I think this idea of wandering excess is is an important one to lump into the categories that you were using about sex, which again, can't fit any repressive model, like always goes beyond that, that repressive model. That there's some sort of reconciliation with wandering excess, which produces anxiety, it seems to me. And, uh, and, and, and this, is, this is where um, I think we have to think through death drive and we have to think through, um, I don't know, the, 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 the function of defense. Does it, Dave, did you want to jump in here with with anything, or um, uh, but also uh, sort of tempting you towards uh, jumping in the course with us, Chitin? Yes, absolutely. Everybody, you're all encouraged to jump in the course with us. Obviously, um, this this conversation will be live streamed from Cadell's channel on Sunday, or premiered. Right. It'll be premiered when it's yeah. published on. Sunday. I'm going to try to be there in the chat. I know I have a couple of meetings that day and it's going to be complicated, but um, yeah. And then I plan on republishing this from my podcast as well as from the channel as well. So um, seriously, everybody, thank you so much for participating. Um, I know there's probably a couple more things that you'll want to touch on here before we close out, Cadell, but I think we've just about reached the point. 
Well, I, um, I do also want to acknowledge Darian asking another question, but it, it, and it's a very important and, and good one, or not question, but more just, you know, reflection, which I think is important and a, and a good one um, related to video game subjectivity. Um, I, I feel like wrapping up, so, but it, it's, um, so he's basically saying that there's a difference between dying in a video game with a reset to a beginning where you lose all your items versus real death in the sense of a hardcore mode as a feature that has to be imported and implemented in a game. It doesn't come for free as it does in real life. Since the adv advent of hardcore mode as a thing that a game could have, I've often found that I have to self-enforce hardcore mode in games I play that don't structurally have one already for me to be okay to die in a video is actually a big hurdle for me personally. Well, I think it's, well, I just want to say it's a nice reflection and I, I, I mean, we could engage with it, but um, maybe not now, now we're winding down, it's not the time, but, um, but certainly um, if you jump in the course, it's definitely something we can further think through and, and, and work through. But, but I guess the last, last thing, last thing I'll say, and Dave then handed it back over to you is just that for me, um, Alenka's work and specifically what is sex have helped me to reconcile the opposites of on the one hand a very strict and very predictive model of sexuality and on the other hand a very um, open permissive form of sexuality and and I think that 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 avoiding both of those and 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 being in some sense open to being alive and being attached, but with the possibility for disruption is something which I try to carry with me as a process, which is which I think is, is sometimes very difficult. And I think sometimes the mind freaks out about that, but it's, it's at the same time, I think something like basically to stay alive, we have to be in touch with death. <laughs> And, and to keep that alive and to keep that and to keep that alive in my work as well. So um, so this is the end of like sort of Dave and I's sort of, um, you know, opening and, and, and introduction and conclusion and, and then invite you like we're going to we're going to really go hard uh, in May and June to um, go into the cracks of this book and, and hopefully bring it to life for the contemporary political discourse. Um, so uh, with that being said, I'll, I'll, I'll let you finish off, Dave. I guess I'll just say that you're all um, brave souls. You know, I think it takes a lot of courage to talk about something that philosophers have historically not wanted to talk about. Um, we have a token woman present, self-identified token woman. That's my fiance, Anne, but she's also a co-instructor at Theory Underground and she's a thinker in her own right, but she's very new to all of this. And so she said, great lecture. This is all very new to me and I'm excited to work through this book. But the overrepresentation of dudes in the conversation, I don't think is an accident. I think that there are spaces in every city in the United States, in fact, probably in most towns, for women to be able to talk about these kinds of things. And I've been in them. I've, I've sat in on circles to talk about these kinds of things where I'm the only guy. And um, I, I think part of the part of the thing, part of what it is, is it comes down to drive. And, you know, there's the, if you have ma masculine aspects, but also happen to have a dick and balls, then you're kind of, there's not a lot of uh, appropriate outlets in intellectual spaces to be able to exercise that drive in a way that um, I would say is really productive or healthy or anything like that. And so um, hopefully that's, you know, that is in part what's what what happens here is that it it is a a positive thing. I was talking to Cadell about it. I said that, you know, this th if we don't have these kinds of conversations, if we don't have a book like What is Sex up front and center with the things that are that we do at Theory Underground or the things that he's doing at Philosophy Portal, then we set ourselves up for failure. Because the general tendencies of these two naive gender ideological positions are not going to go away just because you don't want to talk about them, right? But people don't want to talk about them because 
being in a conversation where somebody says sex is real, for instance, just for being in that conversation with someone else can mean that you've got people writing to your faculty advisor, telling you, telling, oh, you need to pull this person's funding. You need to cut them from the program. You need to cut them off from a career. So, you know, it's a, it's a weird world that we're in. And at least at Theory Underground, the, the overwhelming majority of us don't see a future in that, aren't pursuing something like that. And that's why we're able to have these conversations. But there, that's also why there's not a line out the door of people, you know, oh, sign me up, let's do it. Because this is in a sort, uh, in a sort of sense taboo. And so I think that the last two conversations we've had publicly, actually three, if we include the three reasons to we- read what a sex stream, that's, that's those three conversations, I think show that we're not, we're refusing the double blackmail where we're trying to raise ourselves to some other level where we don't just become edgy, you know, transgressive for its own sake, anti-woke or, you know, woke or whatever, just to kind of shock and awe or whatever. And so good on you all. And uh, like I said, I think it takes courage and I think you're all asking the hard questions. And this is really stimulating for me in a way that is going to be very, it's going to drive a lot of my future development as a thinker. So thank you. All right. I mean, well, well said, I think we can, we can end, we can end on that note. Class starts May 7th. Again, Big news, Alenka is going to be in the course. You get a chance to meet her, get a chance to talk to her. I think that's going to be a fantastic opportunity. So, you know, looking forward to this. And it's an honor to present with Dave. It's it's a pleasure to present with Dave. And um, with that being said, we'll, we'll shut it down for the night. So have a great night, everyone. And now a quick message from our sponsors. Just kidding. This will be neither quick nor from any corporate or state sponsorship. What follows is a description of Theory Underground, a thank you to its patrons, information about the upcoming tour, and three brand new courses that you might want to enroll in. Stay for the whole thing to get promo codes to save on those courses or information about the financial aid scholarship. Theory Underground is a philosophy lecture course gated social media site and publishing house by and for working class intellectuals and renegade academics. The subject matters dealt with at Theory Underground are the most important, yet neglected for understanding ourselves, the world, and ways of possibly changing it. Because we have no corporate or state sponsors, only a small band of patrons, everything in this first year of operation helps immensely. Special thank yous to Bert, Nance, Marilyn, Carl, and Adam for your help in the $50 per month patron tier. If you want to help but the $50 tier is too much, consider donating towards meals and gasoline via Venmo or PayPal. The gasoline is for our countrywide tour of the U.S., where we aim to meet with supporters of this effort and do events to draw in new people who do not necessarily belong to marketing demographics predetermined by the attention economy. We will be giving lectures, leading discussions, and promoting several brand new books. Our goal is to only go to towns and cities where we have personal invitations from at least one person. We are doing this underground style, which for the hardcore punk scene in the US meant coming for long enough to get to know the area and do multiple events, not this modern treadmill of a new city each night in an attempt to maximize fame and profit. If you are interested in being a host, guide, or volunteer, then please fill out the form at https colon forward slash forward slash theory hyphen underground dot com forward slash us hyphen tour hyphen 2023. In an attempt to utilize the resources made publicly available, we will be using libraries for most of our events. So if you have a local library card and can reserve a space for us, we would most appreciate it. Alternatively, some of you might have access to pretty epic venue spaces. Just let us know ahead of time. Now for the courses. The three upcoming courses are What is Sex, Digital Literacy and CMT, Critical Media Theory, and Being and Time. All courses at Theory Underground are available after the fact on demand, but some people get a lot more out of doing it live with a cohort. If you are looking to think deeply about the devices we have become reliant on while experimenting with new ways of reclaiming your attention span and relationship with yourself and others, 
then check out Digital Literacy and Critical Media Theory, a course that is structured to combat the attention economy while strategically using some of its tools to help us gain a freer relationship to our devices. If interested, an introduction to this course will be shared at the end of this video. Just make sure to click on it. The lectures for this course take place on the second Sunday of every month for six months, starting in May. If you sign up at tier three, you also get access to the recovery group component, which also meets once per month. Enroll with promo code CMTEARLYBIRDYT before May 13th for 20% off. If you are frustrated by the discourse revolving around gender ideology, left and right, then join us in thinking deeper about sex. Cadell Last of Philosophy Portal is joining up with Theory Underground to teach Alenka Zupanchik's What is Sex? one of the most succinct and cutting-edge works of theory dealing with the topic. Zupanchik is one of the Slovenian circle's most incisive critics of both naive progressivism and reactionary tendencies when it comes to thinking about the relationship between sex, culture, and subjectivity. If interested, watch Three Reasons to Read What is Sex, which will be shared on screen at the end of this video. What is Sex begins in May and goes through June, meeting for four lecture sessions and, surprise, you will actually get to meet Alenka Zupanchik herself. Use promo code WHATISSEXEARLYBIRDYT before May 7th for 20% off. And just so you know, everybody, don't stress the capitalization. I just make it that way so it's more readable. It's not case sensitive. Being in Time is one of the most notorious, profound, and difficult works of philosophy from the last 200 years. Its deconstruction of modernity and fundamental challenge to scientism is a prerequisite rite of passage for any thinker who wants to seriously engage with continental philosophy, social theory, or world change. In this course, you will learn about what Heidegger means by being, being in the world, Dasein, being unto death, and so many other crucial developments. But more important than all these buzzwords is just taking on this work itself and wrestling with the text. Doing so will rapidly accelerate your reading comprehension abilities and simultaneously challenge some of your most deep-seated presuppositions. As before, an introductory video to this course is shared on the end screen of this video or can be accessed from the links in the description. Being in Time Division 1 starts in June and ends July 22nd. Division 2 begins August 19th and goes through October. To sign up for Division 1 today, use the promo code BEINGINTIMEEARLYBIRDYT before the end of May for 20% off. If you feel obstructed by the cost of these courses, then we have good news. But before getting into the financial aid info, why are there even price tags at all, much less tiered pricing? First, because some people just want to audit, whereas others want constructive critical feedback or even one-on-one -on -one sessions. The tiers exist so that you can get the value you are seeking while compensating me, Dave, fairly for the time and energy required. Second, the prices set for these courses aim to make Theory Underground sustainable, meaning that it will bring in enough to pay for the costs of the operation, including my personal bills since I want to be a co-earner in the household when my soon-to-be wife and I start a family. <laughs> Thirdly, <laughs> Thirdly, People tend to take the things they pay for more seriously, and we want you to get the most out of this experience. With those reasons aside, we do not seek to exclude anyone who is struggling just to get by. We have a financial aid scholarship option for people who are currently between jobs or who live in a country on a cheap currency, like many of you who watch from Thailand, India, Mexico, or Poland. To name a few of the residents of some of the people who have already received financial aid scholarships in the last couple of months. Because I know what trying to study theory under the stresses of housing insecurity and poverty is like, the scholarship was set up during the first month of operation. Simply fill it out at https colon forward slash forward slash theory hyphen underground dot com forward slash scholarship. Last but not least, stay tuned for the Theory Underground app coming soon to an app store near you on your phone. Yeah, and seriously, thank you for listening or watching to this point. And uh, yeah. Thanks. We look forward to taking these courses with you. Bye.